Welcome to Today All Day and our special building community. I'm Joe Fryer. You know, it's no secret that humans want to connect with each other, to be part of something bigger than themselves. And every day, people across this country are lending a hand to their neighbor, fostering that sense of belonging in many unique ways. For the next 30 minutes, we'll shine a light on these people and their stories. First up, a library like you have never seen before, one that lends tools instead of books, building a shared DIY community for one Northwest Seattle neighborhood. Take a look, here's Craig Melvin. Craft supplies, sewing machines, paint supplies, gear, sanders. Welcome to the Northeast Seattle Tool Library. It's a lending library of some 8,000 tools from automotive to landscaping to hand and power tools of every sort. Josh Epstein is a full-time coordinator here. A tool library is a place where people can come and get tools. And they borrow them just like a book library, and bring them back when they're done. Yeah. Sweet. You Have a good one. You too. Like many of its 2,000 members, Josh first found the tool library because of a home renovation project he needed some help with. I was converting my garage into living space and needed scaffolding, like huge scaffolding, which could be thousands of dollars if you're even just renting it, let alone buying it. And they had 20 foot scaffolding here and I was just amazed. Got all that and was able to convert this garage, learning mostly from YouTube and some friends. That kind of do-it-yourself attitude is at the core of this community. Maya Altshuler, now a sophomore at Smith College, has been in the process of converting an old school bus into a tiny home with a whole lot of help from the tool library. It's fun to say that my first car is a bus. We stripped out all the seats, replaced the flooring, put in cabinets. It would be really cool to get it to a place where I could potentially live in it full time if I wanted to. Pick a board, cut a 90 and a 45. I want to empower somebody to do something they never thought they could do. Do you feel okay? Yeah, I did. Okay. Members also have access to a wood shop where Trisha Sillis is a shop steward. She's one of the 100 volunteers that keep this community space going yes. strong. And she's looking to break stereotypes about who works with tools. Members do look at me for advice. They don't look past me for the advice. They actually engage me and being dismissed as that older woman who probably doesn't know, uh, that's not true. There are about 50 independent tool libraries like this one spread throughout the country with different membership models. At this Seattle library, they have an optional yearly donation, but membership is free and open to all. A surprising number of them are in very good condition. Recycling and reuse are at the core of what tool libraries do. Carl Coney is one of the many volunteer repair people on site tasked with keeping the tools in rotation for as long as possible. I've always prided myself on fixing things rather than replacing them. Everybody doesn't need to have a pressure washer if they only use it four times a year. Uh, so having a place where they can just come in and then take whatever they want for their project, uh, that makes real environmental sense. It's a lot of stuff that doesn't have to be manufactured and then disposed of. We know that there's environmental problems going on right now. We know that communities are connected and we know that people are needing to save money right now. And so we're doing all those things. This is a movement that is really actually building a lot of momentum right now. We're getting this done and talking about the future of how we want to grow and change the world through the tool libraries. Next up, we head to the middle of the country to learn about a business built on second chances. In St. Louis, Missouri, the Laughing Bear Bakery offers formerly incarcerated people a job and a serving of compassion. Laughing Bear Bakery in St. Louis is not your typical bakery. It's a place that believes in second chances. They have volunteers, but the paid employees all share one thing in common, a criminal record. Candy up. It all started with the bakery's founder, Kaylin McAllister, a prison chaplain at the Farmington Correctional Center. Guys would come to me about two weeks before they were released and they would say, hey chap, we don't even want to get out of prison because if we get out, nobody will hire us, we'll recommit, we'll be back in prison. 
The employment numbers for ex-offenders are staggering. Those who've been to federal prison have a 60% jobless rate and 27% of people who've been to state prison are unemployed. I made a promise to the guys. I said, you know, when I retire, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to create a business where we only hire ex-offenders. I put an outreach to people. I collected a whole $2,000 worth of donations. And Laughing Bear Bakery was born. The mission, to give a clean slate to the formerly incarcerated. We can encounter a lot of rejection, a lot of criticism. People talk bad or down about you or about ex-prisoners in general. And so it's a lot to overcome that. Lawanda, who asked us to withhold her last name for privacy, left prison in 2021 and eagerly took a position at Laughing Bear. It's like a lifeline to me. No one should be thrown away. No one. And so it made me feel like I was like reborn almost. Regular customer Kathy Vogel doesn't just come in for the bakery's famous bear candy. It's the people that keep her coming back. When you walk in the door, she's a ray of sunshine. She sings, she's happy, you know, and always ready to feed you with a smile. We got poppies, we might still have some smoke. It's fun when I get to interact with customers. I like when they order and then they say, you made this? I like this. I'm like, thank you. You know, I like it when they're happy. Kaylin and the team at Laughing Bear have created a community that focuses on the future instead of their past. When you come out of prison, you're lost. You don't have anybody to talk to about your experience. And they can talk to each other. They understand where they're coming from. They share things. They support each other. Support that works. Laughing Bear Bakery says 7% of the 43 ex-offenders who've worked here since 2015 have reoffended and returned to prison. Compare that to the nearly 50% statewide who reoffend within the first five years. As its popularity surged, Laughing Bear started to outgrow its small rental kitchen, so Kaylin turned to the community for help. We did a big fundraiser. People stepped up to the plate. This is not just me. This is a, a big community coming together to make this happen. Thanks to those donations, Laughing Bear was able to buy a storefront last July, becoming a permanent fixture of the community. It means everything to Kaylin, but it means everything to us too. Lawanda plans to continue Laughing Bear's mission to serve second chances by helping those who follow in her footsteps. You have to want to give that back. You have to want to help someone else. You have to want to be a part of that process. You just do. What a special community. Thank you so much to the folks at the Laughing Bear Bakery for letting us tell their amazing story. After the break, we'll explore how sports can bring people together by introducing you to a brand that's building Native American representation in skateboarding. Welcome back. For the last 20 years, Apache Skateboards has worked tirelessly to build a brand that represents the Native American community. We caught up with the founders to learn more about how they're strengthening their culture through their board designs, while also fostering a love of the sport. 
Craig Melvin has their story. I think the role of art in Apache culture has always been important because we made art for one another. When I made Doug, I painted his skateboard. I remember thinking, well, a hundred years ago, I would have made him a bow and arrow, but now I made him a skateboard. The seed for Apache skateboards was planted 20 years ago when a young Doug Miles Jr. asked his dad for a special gift. We were at the mall. He said, Dad, he goes, I need a board and my board is broken. I didn't have enough money for a name brand skateboard with art on it. I said, son, I'll buy you the blank one and I'll paint it when I get home. I painted an Apache warrior on there. When he got home, he said, Dad, everybody wants one. And so, Apache Skateboards was born. It resonated because at the time, they made us feel proud. We want to see ourselves on the skateboards. As an artist, Doug Miles Sr. hoped his designs could teach others about his culture. Telling the story of Apache history was important. The struggle that Apache people had to deal with in America hasn't really been talked about from an Apache perspective. The Apache point of view is extremely important. I'm just one person, and it's just one skateboard. And even though I may be just scratching the surface, it was a good, fun way to encourage kids to learn more about their history. As the company has grown, so has the popularity of the sport in Native American communities. I think skateboarding is popular because you get to express yourself in all types of different ways, whether it's painting, art, music, filmmaking, because skateboarding is all of those things. You know, as a father, watching Doug become the skateboarder that he is, uh, it's almost unfathomable for me because I'm an artist, but his art is on the skateboard. And when I look at him skateboarding, I always think to myself, he is literally reshaping space and creating new uses for space out here on the res. Today, the father and son team are on a mission to increase access to skate parks on reservations. In these Native American communities, there's not a skate park on every reservation. And when there are skate parks, they don't take it for granted. Shaping and strengthening their community along the way. And I think that's this thing that keeps calling us home. It keeps uh, causing us to be creative in our own community. When we are building the community, you know, it's for the future. Doug Miles isn't just skate rad and skate cool. Doug Miles is living and working and skating in his own communities. With every grind, Doug Jr. is carving a path for the next generation to follow. I think that when you can see someone doing something in the same place as you, you kind of have a little more hope and say, hey, I could do this too. Um, this is possible for me. When you can walk in through the door first, you can open the door, people can follow you through. And our thanks to Craig for that great story. Now, let's go running. You know, many people think of it as a solo endeavor, each runner on their own journey, but we have an incredible story of one man who conquered his first New York City Marathon this year, encouraged by the running community he discovered in the Bronx, New York. Jorge Aguilar calls the path ahead of him an obstacle of his own choosing. Any nerves at all? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah right here in my belly. There, there's a burst of butterflies in there. As scary as that 26.2 mile course may sound, Jorge will tell you it's far better than the obstacles that were not of his own choosing, the ones he faced after moving from Costa Rica to the Bronx when he was seven. I thought we were going to the, the land of, of the Simpsons and Mickey Mouse, um, but it was tougher. Those obstacles seemed endless. He and his mom were poor. Jorge was bullied because he didn't speak English, he even faced the threat of deportation. You know, I got, I got jumped and robbed several times as a kid. That stuff carries with you into adulthood, doesn't it? It does, it, it leaves scars. Mental scars that finally started to heal when Jorge started to run. About three years ago, he joined a running club, the Boogie Down Bronx Runners, located in the same borough where he now works as a child psychiatrist. And it's so meaningful. You could have moved to another neighborhood, why not? I don't want to work anywhere else. 
uh, there's no greater need for, for mental health services, I think, than here. The Bronx is also where Jorge has been training. I once ran 18 miles on this track. Oh my goodness. Isn't that crazy? How many loops around is that? <laughs> Too many. <laughs> He can't wait to run through his hometown borough, which he'll reach during mile 20 of the marathon. I think I'm going to cry. <laughs> I think I'm going to cry, Joe. Um, <laughs> I, it's going to be on my mind for the first 19 miles of the race. Can't wait to get to the Bronx, where it all started. Jorge now looks forward to the route ahead, knowing the toughest road is already behind. Along the course, Jorge had the support of his wife and his two-year-old son, Miguel. He finished all 26.2 miles with an official time of three hours, 38 minutes, and 48 seconds. After the break, a story about young women coming together, learning to love themselves fully, including the natural state of their hair. From curls to coils to kinks, rocking natural hair can be a way for black women to express themselves and celebrate their heritage. In Atlanta, Georgia, some of these women are creating safe spaces for each other to embrace who they truly are. Take a look. Chanel Jones has their story. We don't have a lot of role models to tell us what's beautiful about ourselves. And rentals like this are important because it's representation. Everybody needs representation. I remember this experience. I feel like it's actually really life-changing. At the Black Hair Experience in Atlanta, Georgia, nostalgia and self-love reign supreme. Each room, each booth has a different story to tell. You see how people went through in their past, like the 90s. But for many black women, including sisters Gabrielle and Gabrielle Francis, the story of how they came to embrace their hair is complicated. Growing up, I always felt like my hair was unique, but I also, I guess I didn't love it as much as I should have. I used to see people with braids and with wigs and like with their hair straight in. And like, I used to want to do the same thing. I felt like my confidence would come from my hair being like theirs. The girls attended the Black Hair Experience on a field trip hosted by the mental health advocacy group, Black Girls Smile. Lauren Carson founded the organization in 2012 and since then has impacted over 10,000 young women nationwide. What we try to focus on with Black Girls Smile with all of our programs, all of our events is just really making sure young black women feel safe, they feel protected and they feel supported to really focus on how to lead a mentally healthy life. The baddies have bad days and sad days too. And we want them to know when that happens, what are the tools that they can pull on to feel good about their physical self, but also to make sure mentally that they're doing well. The relationship between hair and mental health is one that Black Girls Smile is currently helping young women navigate. 
too long it has been a standard of beauty that does not fit for a lot of young black women. And if everything around having good hair is tied to being as close to whiteness as possible and appearing a certain way to align with this kind of dominant narrative around what hair should look like, what hair should be like, then we're still feeding into this oppressive system. The natural hair journey has been this reclaiming of like our inherent worth. There are ways to empower ourselves through our hair. I know that when I'm struggling with my mental health and well-being, and a lot of people, you don't care about your image. And in many cases, people don't always see that as a warning sign, but it is a warning sign that someone's struggling with their mental health or well-being. While at the Black Hair Experience, Lauren and Paige invited clinical psychologist, Dr. Ayana Abrams to lead the women and girls in a conversation dedicated to understanding the ways the relationship with their hair impacts their well-being. Right now, I just want you to close your eyes and I want you to touch your hair. And I want you to really connect with what you're feeling. I want you to all come into this room where you're safe, where you're seen, where you're heard. For the girls, the importance of gathering in sisterhood rang true. Some people are criticized very harshly because of their hair, and they might not have somebody who they can relate to. So having groups like this would give them a chance to connect with other people and not feel like alone in the world. And for the Francis sisters, being a part of this community has been life affirming. I tend to help people more than I help myself and I tend to put everyone first before I put myself first. The Black Girl Smile has helped me learn that if I'm not strong for myself, then I can't be strong for anyone else. I would not be here if it was not for Black Girl Smile. Seriously, I really would not. Every single time we have a meeting, I'm like, hey, like, you've done so much in my life and I don't even think you understand how much, like, you empowered me to be a better person. I feel like I've been able to find myself. Now to Memphis, Tennessee. The city is known for its blues, its barbecue, and its famous Beale Street. It's also home to a vibrant and unfortunately vulnerable transgender community that faces social and economic challenges. That's where my sister's house has stepped in. It's an organization working to change these realities by building homes for trans black women in the community. It's a city known for its barbecue and blues, but just minutes from the hustle and bustle of Beale Street, Memphis, Tennessee is also home to a vibrant yet vulnerable transgender community that faces social and economic challenges. We're in the Bible Belt of the South, and it's a, it's a red state in terms of housing access and discrimination, employment access and discrimination. There's no real legal protections for trans people. Nationally, one in five trans individuals is said to have experienced homelessness at some point in their life, and nearly a third live in poverty. Those figures are even higher when you account for race. I was born and raised here in Memphis, Tennessee. When Kayla Gore was just 23 and newly transitioning, she experienced homelessness while living 1,500 miles from the city where she grew up. It was very, very scary. After returning to Memphis, she entered a transitional housing program and began working without Memphis, the local LGBTQ community center. During that time, Kayla says she started to see a lot of trans and queer people kicked out of their homes at the age of 18, some rejected by their families. While there are services for individuals experiencing home insecurity in Memphis, many are faith-based. There's lots of anti-LGBTQ rhetoric, and more importantly, a lot of those shelters are separated by sex assigned at birth. You're forced into a situation of either outing yourself or staying closeted in an environment where you could be incredibly unsafe. There's also a lot of trans folks of color here, so then you also kind of double down with racism. They have a lot stacked up against them. The pandemic exacerbated that. A survey by the Trevor Project found last year more than 80% of trans and non-binary youth said COVID-19 led to a more stressful living situation. Hoping to change that, Kayla, who'd been able to purchase her own home, which she shared with others who found themselves experiencing homelessness, founded My Sister's House. We wanted to provide like a space where people can thrive and they can actually start to grow um, and heal the trauma that they had you know, experienced in their youth.
Originally a word-of-mouth program, My Sister's House aimed to provide emergency services and shelter to trans and queer people of color. It's for us by us. Like, it's trans people at the helm of it, and it's from a perspective of someone who's been there. I was homeless as a youth, so I, I remember what it was like being vulnerable. As My Sister's House evolved, so did their mission. Now the group is aiming to build 20 homes for trans women in Memphis. It's safe to say that I did not come from a background of building houses or working with plumbing and electrical, uh, but it is safe to say that I came from a family that had really love and compassion for the community that they live in. Originally planning to build tiny homes, they're now <laughs> renovating existing homes because of the rising costs of everything, including lumber. Using a lottery of individuals they've previously helped, recipients get more than a shelter, they actually own the house. It's a different feeling when you um, have your own place. Jeanette Adams moved into her home just a few months ago. It's a tiny house, but it, you know, it's big to me. Jeanette had been living with her mom and has a supportive family, but being able to live on her own has boosted her confidence. I felt free. A lot of people, especially trans women, we don't get a chance to own anything. Kayla says that's exactly what she's hoping to provide those selected to receive a house. Trans people are boxed out of economics in so many different ways that we have to build our own economics. This is how people built generational wealth 100 years ago where their families had small homes. So it's nothing new that we're doing. It's just that we're doing a unique thing for a community that really deserves it. Just a couple miles from Jeanette's home, crews are replacing the electrical system at another property. This will be our fifth house that will be occupied. Modi James will soon call this two-bedroom home her own sanctuary. I'm ecstatic about it because it would be mine. It's my, it would be my home, not my house. Modi says she does not feel safe in her current living arrangement. I've been trying to get a home on my own. They take you through the ringer and they're expensive. I see nothing and I live nothing but poverty. I'm trying to overcome it. LGBTQ advocates in Memphis say my sister's house is giving people more than a place to live. It also created visibility and hope and inspiration for the trans community and for trans people of color here in the South that just wasn't there before. If I had the opportunity to receive the resources that we provide today, I couldn't imagine what my life would be like. Kayla hopes to expand and replicate what my sister's house has done in other cities. But she also hopes the program has something of an expiration date. I would want the legacy of my sister's house to be that we came, we conquered, and we disappeared because we no longer were needed. What amazing work Kayla and my sister's house are doing down in Memphis. We hope you've enjoyed our Today All Day special building community. For more stories like the ones that you've been watching, tune in to Today All Day. Greetings, everyone. The holidays are upon us, and we are ready to celebrate right here on Today All Day. From tips for that turkey to cooking up your very first holiday spread, we have got you covered. So tune in to Today All Day, all season long.
are back with Today Wellness, and you know the old saying, you are what you eat. Well, it's especially true when it comes to brain function, apparently. Your brain in charge of keeping your heart beating, lungs breathing, allowing you to move, feel, and think. <laughs> yeah, the brain's real important. Yeah. <laughs> so to keep your brain in peak working condition, we're going to tell you about five foods to add to your diet to help improve memory, energy levels, and sleep. Dr. Taz Batia is an integrative wellness physician and host of the Superwoman Wellness Podcast. But this is for everybody. Dr. Yes. Taz, good morning. Good morning. So you're saying before we get to it that, that if you start incorporating these into your diet, you'll see results relatively quickly the beauty about kind of getting your diet right is usually within three weeks oh. you can see a change and it can be as quiet as you have more sleep and you have more energy to like you're on and you're focused and ready to go wow. what is about these foods that we're gonna look at here what is about these particular foods and, and other items that give the brain that boost well what why we have picked these foods is because we call them superfoods they just have a ton of nutrients for every serving okay. so they're su they're efficient right so if you're trying to get these nutrients in, this is an efficient way to do it to keep your brain and your energy superpower. All right, our first super ingredient is yes. magnesium. Where do we find that? So magnesium, I always call the miracle micronutrient. It helps us with sleep. It helps calm us down. It helps balance serotonin. Try that. It's Believe so it or not, dark chocolate is going to be oh, one of production. our best sources. An ounce of it has about 64 milligrams of magnesium okay. in it. Legumes are great. They come in at about 70 milligrams. A tablespoon of flax, which you see right here, mm -hmm. at about 40. Avocado also has magnesium, but less than the dark chocolate. So you, you have this recipe, these little balls, what are in those then? So it's a lot of cacao, which has a lot of the magnesium mm -hmm. and the antioxidants in it, almond butter for the healthy fats, flax seeds, mm -hmm. mix it up together, super easy, has a little bit of oat too. A little dark chocolate in there. A little in dark there. chocolate in there. So it's, it's yummy, yummy right? Yeah. Stuff. And not too much calories no, either, Not too many it? calories. No. So if you have a chocolate craving, you go for Let's it. Let's talk collagen here. Because yes. Because collagen, you say, is, it's actually naturally occurring in our bodies. We all have it. We've all got collagen. It's naturally occurring. We know it for skin and health, hair and overall health but it actually helps support the gut lining, helping us to absorb the nutrients. So, so many people are eating healthy, but they're not absorbing what they're eating. Collagen comes in and helps us with that, helps the brain, helps energy. It's in a lot of naturally occurring proteins. So we've got salmon here, for example, and chicken. You know, these are things that are a great way to get salmon in. This looks like chicken this stock. Is, How would you use it? This is bone broth. Bone so broth. Some people oh. will just drink bone broth and get a great Roker, source Roker of collagen. Doesn't. Try a swig. Roker does Wash that. And then if you're, if you're vegetarian, you can get some collagen from your vegetables as well. It's just that we get a lot more through our proteins and through our bone broth. Okay. I, I, these are cruciferous. Those are can cruciferous. we only get the collagen from cruciferous? Not vegetables? necessarily. Okay. No, yeah. you can get it from other vegetables as well. It's just not as dense. All right, this is a new one on me. Choline. What is that? Why is it good? So choline, I feel like, doesn't get enough press, and I'm so glad <laughs> we're talking about it today. So choline actually is a nutrient that comes in and coats all our nerves. So it helps us with learning, Never with memory, that. with hmm. focus. And we really want to get choline in our diet. So choline is naturally found in eggs. Eggs are one of the best sources. Huh but you've got to eat the egg yolk. Okay. The yolk has the choline, it has about 140 milligrams. We've got mushrooms and burgers here. Which one do you think has more choline? Mushrooms. Mushrooms. You guys win. Good, Good job. job. So mushrooms actually have more choline How than a burger. How many eggs would you have to eat or mushrooms? Like what's a serving to get enough choline so any given day? Just, this is the beauty of eggs. One full egg, including oh. the yolk, will okay. do it. You need a cup of mushrooms. You actually need two burgers to get the choline. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ooh, I mushroom love choline. Mushrooms, yeah. mushrooms and eggs, I guess. There yeah. we go. This, this, mushroom is, burger. this is something I've never Never heard of. Oh, ghee. I've heard of this. I've it's like butter or something. Ghee is uh, it's like butter. That's a great way to think about it. It's clarified butter. It's been used in Eastern systems of medicine for a really long time, and it's been used as a healing fat. Mm. And the reason is is because ghee actually has less lactose, less casein. So if you've got somebody that's dairy intolerant, yeah. can't tolerate that stuff, they can usually tolerate ghee very well. But the secret superfood ingredient here is MCT or medium chain triglycerides. That helps the brain. It helps the gut. It balances everything living down here in the mm. gut and that is really the powerhouse the source of our energy so if we're not getting some of these healthy fats in that's one of the biggest reasons I see brain and energy start to go down. how do you get ghee in your diet I'm not looking to yes take a big old no bite we don't want that. you we, and we don't want you, you to do put that it on toast you can put it on toast literally all you need is about a quarter to a oh, half wait, of a teaspoon sure that, a tiny little bit a tiny little teaspoon you don't need okay. a lot and you can spread it on something you, it also has a higher smoke point so you can bake and fry with it oh, as well okay. so you can use it as Butter. Exactly. All I right. see artichokes and I see tea. 
Milk yes. thistle. Milk thistle. Okay, so this is now something that is not naturally occurring. This is an herb. It comes. Milk thistle is an herb. It comes from a flowering plant, but it has so many great benefits in supporting liver health. The liver is something again we don't talk about very much. Our livers work <laughs> hard. The reason sure. between alcohol and between just the environment, right? We get a lot of burden to our liver. So it's naturally occurring in artichokes, but an easier way to get Got it in right is to get the tea in. All right, you know this feeling. Your brain is exhausted, but you. Still have a hundred things left to do on your to-do list, and the only thing you can think about is taking a nap. I feel that. Well, today we are beating back brain fog and fighting fatigue with the one and only nutritionist health expert. Jo I'm going to give another her another oh, way. You guys have been, your friend. All roads lead through Stephanie Rule. I just realized you yeah. guys have been friends for a while. Joy too. Bauer and I hadn't met. I called her during COVID yeah. and I said, I help need me. some health advice. I am home with my kids all day, eating, baking, eating, baking. And, and she did. And what a great Perfect. student she is. And she oh did my what gosh. you suggested. Everything. And you Everything. don't deprive, which is the key Ever. piece of it. Ever. All right. Let's talk about getting our energy back. We need our mojo. Yeah. And I think, like, having more energy is something everyone yeah, wants sure. more of. And believe it or not, having more energy during the day actually traces back to getting a good night's sleep. And okay. here's why. It is so important to get a solid night's sleep. And that is seven to nine hours a night. Because when you go to sleep, your body slows down your metabolism mm -hmm. and conserves energy. And mm -hmm. we know through research, when you conserve energy, that next day, our cells are more energy efficient. So they ignite more readily and you have more energy. So this is what we're gonna start with. So, so get some good sleep. The yeah, enemy, so, so the again, enemy. <laughs> well, but here, this is something really cool. You, you can roll in the sheets, but you cannot scroll in the sheets. And here's mm -hmm. why. Cute choice. <laughs> I'm not looking for either one, just FYI. <laughs> I'm a hard pass on both. Yeah. We like our sleep. <laughs> so, so here's the thing. When it's dark and you're laying down to get a good night's sleep, if you have your smartphone or your iPad mm -hmm. or a computer, the blue light that emanates off the screen is going to interfere with melatonin production. Yeah. Melatonin is a very important hormone that's released mm -hmm. in the brain that promotes sleepiness. So right. if you interfere with that production, you're okay. not going to be able to fall asleep. So get rid, get rid of, of the all phone. of Wear the, the screens. Yes. All right, let's yes. talk about foods. So the winning formula when it comes to food mm -hmm. is protein plus fiber plus healthy fat. And here's why. Okay. The three things together steady your blood sugars okay. and will leave you feeling sustained with your energy levels. Very, very important. So I'm showing some breakfast options here. Mm -hmm. Greek yogurt with some fresh fruit. I Why love Greek it. yogurt? Because Greek yogurt has more than twice the amount of protein as traditional yogurt. And by the way, traditional yogurt is still good because it has some protein, but Greek yogurt has loads of protein. So is the sweetness, it comes from the fruit, not from like honey or something else? Well, if you, you, can, you can get a plain Greek yogurt mm -hmm. and then be in control of how much sweet you put mm -hmm. in. I would say one teaspoon of maple syrup or honey is okay, okay, but if you can omit that and just really sweeten it up with juicy, fabulous, wholesome fruit, Cause, that's... Because the sugar makes you go high and low, exactly. too. Exactly. Okay. And so this is an apple or a banana with nut butter. Can we just look how at this swirl? How did you put this on? How I didn't like Anthony Stop did this. it. Stop this. He's what? like a genius. Yeah. And so the apple provides juicy fiber and complex carbohydrates and loads of nutrition. And the nut butter, whether, whether it's peanut butter or cashew butter or almond butter or soy nut butter, whatever butters, we love all the butters. Yeah. It's got the healthy fat and the protein. Mm -hmm. And this is oatmeal for fiber and seeds and nuts. See, we have almonds here. Right. I love pumpkin seeds. So are those, what about chia seeds? Are those important? Chia seeds are great. Good. Okay. Chia seeds are great. Yeah. All right, take us to the beverage department. Okay. I'm going to just say this is great. I don't <laughs> even know what it is. I am so excited. Take a sip of this. What is it? I made a healthy, no sugar added frappuccino. Wait, it's coffee? Okay, that's the Yes. So I added a shot of espresso, mm, mm. and then there's a frozen banana, I some can taste ice, the banana. It's yummy. cocoa powder for brain boosting what? compounds, and a little bit of milk. Almond milk is in this mm. one. So it's a dairy free version. It's light it in tastes, calories, and it gives you a jolt. It, it feels tastes, like a dessert. Isn't it? Yummy. Great? All right, it's great. what about just drinking water? Mm. And, and so water mm. hydration is very important, crazy important. If you're slightly dehydrated, yeah. you're going to feel fatigue. So everybody says, how much water do I need? The mm. first thing is it doesn't have to be plain water. It could be sparkling water. Coffee and tea count towards your hydration. Oh, they do? Yes, oh. as does okay. milk. Are so, you good about drinking water? Um, yes, I am. It's one of Naturally the things like that. or yeah. you're disciplined about? Uh, well, I am disciplined, but I, tr I drink probably like six of those bottles a day. 
little That's ones. That's amazing. Yeah. So you're, are you're it actually surpassing no, really because you got to chug it, man. So you can't just when just it's down. when it's room temperature yeah. or you have a straw, you could suck it down yeah. more easily. What if you like it, it cold? Good. Ice water is like a ten in terms of taste. Room temperature is like a four. So you only like ice water? Correct. Do you drink a lot of it? No, I do not, See? and I need to. Okay, yeah. you'll like this guy. So this what is, is this? a spa water. Here. I just added some lemon slices and cucumber and mm. some herbs, so it jazzes it up. It gives a little bit of pizzazz, so it's yeah. more flavorful. You don't like it. And here's no, a I great do. rule no, of thumb. Like you take your weight, <laughs> divide it in half. So let's say you weigh 140 pounds. That's 70 ounces of water you should strive for every single day. Okay. And and what? <laughs> Do you I'm like just, I'm, I do. do you like it? I, I'm, I know how, how little water I drink, so I'm trying to get my reps in. These, <laughs> by the way, guys, I made you a batch of my chocolate energy muffins. So these are light and they're fluffy and they're super delicious and moist, but I added in hmm. some espresso. So you get a shot, a little bit of a jolt, and oh, we're going to put this on Real the good. website. Great. Yeah. Joy, thank you. It's good to see you here. Uh, you can oh, get that, oh. that energy muffin recipe today.com slash food. Love you, Joy. Love you, Hoda. better today and one reason you could be fatigued is maybe due to what you're eating or maybe rather what you're not eating. Oh, we need eating. to know. So Dr. Amy Shaw is renowned for her extensive knowledge on gut health. She's also the author of the new book, I'm so effing tired, <laughs> uh oh, I didn't know you could say that, a proven plan to beat burnout, boost your energy and reclaim your life. Dr. Shaw, welcome. Thank you so much for having me to both of you. Oh, well, thank you. So Dr. Shaw, what, what do you think is the biggest complaint mm -hmm. you know everybody is tired I think yeah. this year has made people tired right but what do you yeah. hear from your patients that is the number one thing I hear I'm so effing tired the title of the book for far too long women's concerns about why we're so tired have been dismissed I mean it, maybe it's because we're getting older or because we're put you know we're not trying hard enough but I knew there's more than that so I really looked into it further it's about you know what we're eating when we're eating and stress management. All right, well, let's talk about then that then, because we know, like I know for myself, if I eat like a piece of salmon and broccoli before I go yes. to bed, and if I wake up the next day, I, I feel better. You're gonna feel great. I always feel yes. better. Yeah. So this is about, so what are the things we should be putting into our body that will help us rest and also have more energy in the next day? It's true. I mean, we can all relate to how tempting it is to have the sweets right yeah. before bed, and especially when we're so tired. But these are not the energy fixes we actually want, especially when we eat them or drink them close to bed. We actually want to be rebuilding our gut health, our immune health, our hormone health, this energy trifecta, uh, interconnected way that we get energy. So you want to be eating foods that build up that gut bacteria that gets damaged. With just two nights of sleep, you damage the good gut bacteria. Um, so you really want to rebuild right. that when, you, when, two, when you're chronically sleep deprived. Something um, like, you know, Jerusalem artichokes, broccoli, asparagus, 
ginger, onions, garlic, yams. These are amazing ways to feed that good gut bacteria with prebiotic fiber. Okay, so prebiotic. if you have two bad nights of sleep, yeah. your gut health can, can yeah. you know, there's the deteriorate. Can yeah. deteriorate. So what yeah. are some foods mm -hmm. that are bad too for the gut health? And yeah. probably it also connects with sleeping. I, I assume if yeah. you're eating something that's not good for your gut yeah. health, you're also not sleeping as well. Yes, things, you you know, when you're tired, you really want to automate your meals. You want to be getting some bright sunlight yeah. to wake you up and then eat some automated breakfast that you love, like a prebiotic breakfast bar or a smoothie bowl, like a green smoothie bowl here with berries. You really want to automate your meals and eat things that are going to be good for that gut bacteria so you can rebuild that energy trifecta, the hormones, the immune system, and the gut, the very base of how we get our energy. Mm -hmm. I mean, the title of your book is I'm So Effing Tired, and I think a lot of people are feeling that. Um, and I know this is a little off point, but other than the foods yeah. that we should be eating, what? Mm -hmm. do, how do you advise your patients? Because we want more energy in the morning. We want to feel good throughout the course of the day. Sometimes it's lack of sleep, but sometimes it's other stuff too. Yeah, I feel that too. So we have an internal clock called circadian rhythms and syncing your body with circadian rhythms is one of the most effective ways to get sustained natural energy and fix that energy trifecta. Something like getting natural sunlight for mm -hmm. a few minutes mm -hmm. in the morning, mm -hmm. something like not eating before bed two hours, it's called circadian intermittent fasting. So you know we are supposed to be doing things in light and dark, right. so really sticking with that. And then what you had mentioned before on the show, not maybe, not not having the screens right before bed, maybe even just 30 minutes uh, screenless yeah. time and so get a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. Quickly, will you just tell us the foods we should avoid right before yeah. bed and yeah. the foods we should be eating? Yes, before bed, you don't want to be eating a lot of chocolate, yep. a lot of wine. I mean, one glass is good, but you know, people just think three glasses is better. That's not the case. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to be having your coffee late at night. Even though, you know, tea is one of the most antioxidant, anti-inflammatory foods, you don't want to have caffeine right before bed. Um, and that goes without saying, but mm -hmm. there's a few foods that can help you sleep, induce melatonin, the mm. melatonin, the sleep hormone that gets released two to three hours before bed. So tart, dark uh, cherries, uh, tart cherries, oh. mm. um, olives are a really great yeah, way to induce melatonin and nuts. Who doesn't love their nuts, nuts. and seeds? So okay. something that you can snack on a few hours before bed. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Thank you Shaw. so much, Dr. It. Shaw. And you can check out Dr. Shaw's book at today.com slash shop. Back in school, you're going to need some healthy afternoon snacks to help them power through because they got to do their homework. No, they have to do their homework, and there is no one better 
than busy mom of four and seriously delicious author Siri Daly. Yes, back to school homework. I mean, we were just talking. My son is in high school now, How is so that like possible? the homework game has just you know up. gone up to here. But I think the problem with snacks are you eat a snack and then you're exhausted after. You need something that keeps that, your energy yes. up. Yes. So this one is my favorite for okay. that because okay. apples. I, I've actually once heard that apples give you more energy than than coffee. I don't oh, know if that's true. But these are well, really I really really loves an apple. She eats an apple a day. Apple yeah, my, yeah, my kids night. love apple and peanut butter. So these are okay. like a fun little way to have apple and peanut butter you make a little sandwich so you're going to core out your apple i like mm -hmm. using you know granny smith but you can use any apple and then tart. when you oh, yeah they're yeah. so good with peanut butter that tart and is creamy. it weird for me to ask how you make the circle so perfect well i like using an apple core oh there's um, a machine um, for there that. is a machine mm -hmm. um I, I suggest yeah it's it's much easier than okay. you know using a knife and trying to do it okay. yourself but um okay so then, you just paint this yeah and butter? then like i like granola. to use a little granola for texture mm -hmm. um of course my kids like Chocolate chips. Oh, yeah, I'm like, yeah. Why, why not? They're having something healthy here. Right. So, mm -hmm. but these are golden raisins. If if your kids like raisins, mm -hmm. um, and then you just make a little sandwich. That's such a cute, and easy you, idea. You can easily easy, have them ready peasy. for when they get home, and it's just really yummy. I eat them too. Yummy. Um, yeah. Love so that's it. one snack. Okay. okay now another really here. really great peanut butter snack are okay. these frozen banana bites. So banana. you're gonna Yum. take a I'm banana. Into this. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you're gonna just slice them into little rounds, and then you're gonna make you. Can make so a sandwich you, if you want. Did you freeze these first? Not yet. No, okay. these are regular. regular. And then you make little sandwiches, but then you're going to freeze them for about an hour until okay, right they get there. firm before you dip them in chocolate. Okay. So over here, we have chocolate that is melted with a tiny little bit of coconut oil. Oh, which oh will, do you need the oil? You don't need it, but what will what that will do is it will harden the chocolate quicker and mm. it also just makes it like nice and shiny Creamy like and this. Shiny, mm -hmm. yeah. So should we dip some? Yes. Oh and then, I know, they're so good. They, you, you can dip it all the way or halfway, whatever you want. And then do you dip it um, in something else? And then, else? you know, just to make it fun, you can add sprinkles, you can add graham crackers, chopped peanuts, whatever you want. And then store them in the freezer and they'll, you know, they'll last for like a week These or two. These are delicious. Yeah, they're so yummy. Um, and the, again, just a great, I like, love that. Um, and you know what? They're delicious with or without the chocolate. Yeah, you don't need the oh, chocolate. Oh, really? I just or you can do half chocolate. Some like of that. this. Yeah. Okay, I'm in. I love peanut butter and banana too. I mean, Me too. Fried. I'm yeah. really happy with that. Okay, and our <laughs> third snack. Um, my daughter Etta loves nachos, but I try so to get I. her to do like some protein with the nachos mm -hmm. because all she does is eat you know, carbs yeah. and cheese all day long. Me too. So this is a little um, tortilla that I've made into a round with like a cookie cutter, like oh. a three inch cookie mm. cutter. Okay. And then we're gonna put it in these muffin tins that are lightly greased. Look and how, you just look at make the shape a little it makes. shape, like mm -hmm. a little flour. Look at those. Isn't that cute? So you're gonna They're bake so it first. Pretty. They're cute. So they get like this. Okay. And then this is a great thing to do with like leftover chicken or mm -hmm. leftover pork or steak, whatever you have in your freezer. Oh my gosh, I have chocolate all over my hands. That's okay. lovely. Um, mix it up with some barbecue sauce, mm. then put it in your cups okay. and of course add cheese and Can then you you'll use like taco seasoning it. too yeah instead totally of totally mm -hmm. um and if you don't you know you don't need to use the meat you can just add a bunch of different veggies but add the cheese bake it until it melts and gets all nice and ooey yeah. gooey over here add toppings if you want so i would eat a, yeah aren't they these so are cute? so cute this i feel like this could also be a meal yeah, and this could be great. Like even if you had a party, when you yeah, you like totally. it's a great like Sunday football. Yes. Yeah, I know you might need to bring this up to your Sunday football rotation. Uh, maybe. Are y'all still making um, pizzas every Sunday? <sighs> yeah, we try to. Yeah, they have a pizza, pizza Sunday. Sunday. Carson Daly is a. I'm into it. Carson's the pizza one. Chef. I'm into it. <laughs> All right, to get these snack recipes, head to today.com/food.
We are back with an Olympics-fueled edition of Tune-Up Tuesday. We've been motivated by the strength and power of our Team USA athletes. Well, today, our pal, today, nutritionist Joy Bauer is here. She's going to share two energy-boosting snacks. Good morning, Hi. Joy. Good morning, guys. We are totally obsessed with the Olympics in my house. We have it on 24-7, and these athletes are insanely talented. So I love that I have the opportunity to share or present two energizing recipes. And the key here is that both of the recipes, aside from tasting totally delicious, they combine protein and fiber to mm -hmm. help steady blood sugars and sustain our energy. So and let's start with breakfast. So I'm calling this, um, it's a banana bread overnight goat <gasps> meal, but not because it doesn't milk? have any goat oh. milk. It's <laughs> because we have, we've designated in my house that it is the greatest of all Ooh, time. Oh, that kind of okay. good. It's a lot to live yes, up to. I think you're going to love it. Okay. okay. So I'm starting with a very ripe banana. If you guys have speckly brown bananas, it's mm. key because the riper it is, the sweeter yeah. mm -hmm. your pudding will be. And I mashed it up right here. If your banana is a little firm, all you have to do is peel it and microwave mm. for about 30 seconds, and it's an easy mash. This is a quarter cup of plain Greek yogurt. Okay. Now I'm adding in, this is almond milk, half a cup, but, you know, you're the boss of your sauce, so you can put in whatever type of milk you have. Okay. Next, half a cup of old-fashioned rolled oats. Mm -hmm. Not the instant. <laughs> Don't do the instant because I like the larger particles mm -hmm. of the old fashioned for this particular recipe. Okay. And this is a tablespoon of ground flaxseed or you could ah. use chia seed. Mm -hmm. It's very important because this is going to help everything come together when we stir it up mm -hmm. and it gets it nice and swelled and firm. And this is a little bit of ground cinnamon and a dash of vanilla. And I'm just going to put in a pinch of salt. Mm -hmm. So that's it. And the reason we call this mm. overnight oats is because you prep it the night before. You mix this up. And then you put it in a pretty little container. I use a mason jar just like this. Right. This is great. And I have all these ingredients you, at home, too. I know. This I'm like, is, okay, I'm very good. When I get home. Now, and you, you put that in the fridge? In the fridge. So I made this one last night. You have to see the hearty serving that it makes. And I'm going to just really show good. you how luscious this is. Look at this, guy. Joy, how I long mean, does it last nice. in the fridge? It'll last about three days in the fridge. Okay. And you could also make multiples one night. And then for several days in advance, you have a whole great big bunch. And what I like to do in the morning is I'll garnish with some toasted pecans. So mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm telling you, this has all the cozy feels of banana bread but not a drop of added sugar and boy when i tell you it hits the sweet spot oh, yeah, there's no sugar that's great. there that's, that's great amazing. your no next thing's got sugar. a little caffeine in it joy oh yeah so we are making what i'm calling coffee bars it's basically a do-it-yourself energy bar with a kick of caffeine there mm. they are so so i'm starting here with this is a cup of oats and I'm adding in, this is a crispy rice cereal, just mm -hmm. like Rice Krispies. Mm -hmm. But if you could find a brand that has brown rice, home run. Right. Okay. This is co cocoa powder. Mm -hmm. And here comes our jolt. <laughs> we, I, we have a tablespoon of instant coffee, oh. or you could put in espresso powder oh. and a little bit of salt. Now you mix this up mm -hmm. and this will be your dry ingredients. Now I'm going to show you the wet ingredients. As they slide the onto the part, screen. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. All sorts of elves behind the scenes. <laughs> Ian, Ian Bauer. And so now I have my wet ingredients. All this here, it's some peanut butter that I mixed with some honey uh -huh. and um, a little bit of vanilla extract. You mix the dry ingredients in. I'm going to save some time. This mixes up yeah. and you put it into a pan that looks just like this with parchment paper mm -hmm. and you press 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 you'll see i also added a little bit of mini dark chocolate chips right. you, you really want to compress it so i'm pressing it down over here and the chocolate chips give it a little bit of something special mm -hmm. extra and then you put it in the fridge for about 30 minutes and guys you cut oh, look so you at no bacon at all. no bacon no that's great you cut it right into that's bars oh that looks good and again yeah. it's got the protein it has the fiber it has a little bit of caffeine so this is not something oh. you want to have close to bedtime but also guys if you want to make it kid friendly or you're caffeine sensitive 
Just yeah. leave out the caffeine sure. and you have a super okay, healthy delicious. Yeah. There you go. I'm drinking coffee, Perfect. but I want that dessert. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. You're, this, is good. Mm. And this is great. This is Chanel not on caffeine. And listen. Yeah. <laughs> I know exactly. <laughs> hey, gold medal, Joy. Thank you so Thank much. You. For these Bye recipes. Mwah. Yay. For these recipes and more, head to today.com slash food. Hey guys, welcome to The Boost. To kick things off, we teamed up with actress Jennifer Garner to spotlight heroes and young students in a part of Kentucky that is still rebuilding more than a year after those historic floods. NBC's Cynthia McFadden joined Garner in Perry County to share more about the work Save the Children is doing to improve the lives of those impacted by that disaster. It just takes your breath away. This used to be the site of the Robinson Elementary School. But does this means childhood to so many so many generations of kids and it's just gone. It's rubble. Last year, Jennifer Garner and I got a look inside after devastating flash flooding brought eight feet of water crashing into the building. Wow. The school and its beloved library were completely destroyed. My little elementary school library totally shaped my life. This was the school's library before the flooding, created in part by Save the Children. This is now the library a rolling cart pushed through the halls of a makeshift building. Hey, guys. Librarian Antoinette Vermillion navigates through crowded hallways where more than 500 students from Robinson and Buckhorn, another flood-damaged school, have been crammed together for more than a year. There you go, then. In a place where one in three children lives below the poverty line and books can be hard to come by, the loss of the library was devastating. It was their escape. It's what I call the heart of the school the heart of the school. It was all taken away. But you yep. go on. Yep, like we always do. You know, I think sometimes people who don't live in rural America see the challenges but not the strength. Right. The children are resilient. But that doesn't mean they aren't hurting. The kids here didn't just lose their school. More than 100 of them had to flee their homes. It's pain that hasn't gone away. The first time that it rained here, it was very chaotic, I'm not going to lie. We had kids crying, screaming, wanting to call their moms. It just brings back everything from that night. Michelle Stacy is a learning specialist at Robinson. What percentage of the kids went through trauma? I would say 100% of these kids are traumatized because they lost their school. You can't learn if you're traumatized, right? We get stressed out sometimes, don't we, babe? Which is why she agreed to help pioneer a Save the Children program called Bridges, designed to give kids a safe place to process their feelings. We saw it in action. Brave and strong, brave and strong. They need to be able to say, I'm not doing okay. This week, a special visitor. And on this farm, he had a a dragon. A rabbit. A rabbit. Oh, a rabbit. Okay. All right. E-I-E-I-O. Garner says she was delighted by what she saw. There's a lot of trauma just in growing up below the poverty line. And um, if you can name it, then you can heal and you can be resilient and move on. And it's amazing. It's amazing to watch in action. You've talked about how libraries changed your life. Mm -hmm. And now seeing that the library is this little push cart. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, that hurts your heart, I know. Children's libraries are some of the most important places in our country. But you know what? A push cart is better than nothing. A push cart with an amazing librarian like we met today, who's prioritizing reading, who's showing the kids that it matters enough that she will push a cart around to make sure they have some books. They're on their way back. Is there, is there one moment from today that you'll take home with you? The kids' faces turned when we started talking about the floods. They wanted me to know how scary it was, what it was like to lose their school, what it was like to lose their homes, where their family went. Between the pandemic and the flooding, these third graders have never had a normal school year. It's a real worry for Principal Jamie Fugit. We have some students uh, that are not reading on grade level. We're working one-on-one -on -one with them 30 minutes a day for five days a week. You know, uh, we, we may lose a couple battles, but we're winning some too. But while these students wait for a new school and a new library, one thing there's no shortage of, love, hugs, 
are everywhere. There's magic that goes on in, in, in these small town schools. I know 100% of our students. I know 99% of my parents. And these, these, these staff members, they, 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 really, they really, really work hard. These children, they need every right to succeed just like everyone else does. And so the books matter. The library matters. The library matters. They sure do. Savannah, back to you. It, it's so, so touched yes. by this. And yeah. Jen, I know you in particular from West Virginia, you have such a heart for this part of the country. You've done amazing work with Save the Children. Being with those kids yesterday, what's your takeaway? My takeaway is really that resilience Resilience comes from the doing. It comes from the putting one foot in front of the other. It comes from figuring things out and acting on it. But it also can't happen in a vacuum. Sometimes you need community to wrap themselves around you. And boy, this community is strong. The teachers are amazing. The leadership's incredible. And Save the Children is really proud to be an ongoing, ever steady presence in this community. And I'm, I'm proud of what, what they've all accomplished together. Yeah, it's, it's completely beautiful. And I know that you guys have got a little something up your sleeve, a few surprises for the kids this morning. We certainly do. We do. Well, so the Today Show reached out and shared the incredible stories of these kids with the folks at Scholastic. And Scholastic was so touched they wanted to help. Jen, you want to do the honors? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. All right. <clears throat> they wanted to do something special for the students joining us live this morning from Robinson Elementary and Buckhorn. So I'm going to have the students and the teachers help me with a little reveal. They don't know this surprise. Okay, ready? All right. Guys, are you ready? Yeah. Let's count down. Ready? Three, two, Each child can take home a few of their very own today. Yeah. Wow. Okay, the teachers. <laughs> Not only that, <laughs> bags are going to every teacher filled with books, filled with books for their classrooms and for them. And while the students start picking out some good reads to take home, we want to bring uh, in our librarian. Yes, you met her in the peas, Antoinette is here. Antoinette Vermillion, come on in. You know, stand right in here. Yes, ma'am. You're not going to cry, are you? No, hopefully no. not. Okay. <laughs> um, so what does it mean to these kids to take home books? It means a lot. You know, I mean, they're replenishing their libraries because they lost. You know, they lost a lot of books. They lost a lot in the flood. So this is a good thing. Well, that's not well, it. That's not all. Okay, Scholastic wanted to help not just the students here with us, but both schools as a whole. Here we go. Oh, wow. Here we go. They are pledging to donate 5,000 books to Robinson and 5,000 books to Buckhorn's future libraries wow. to help replenish what was lost in the flooding. Awesome. So 10,000 10, books. That's can amazing. you hold all 10,000 of those we'll in your cart? Sure no, not in my cart. <laughs> no, definitely not, but we'll make sure that we have a place for them. They have a home on the shelf. Oh, well, great. I have a feeling there are going to be some happy tears. Oh, we? yes. Yes. Most definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Guys, back to you. Wow. Oh, good work. Thank Way you. Go. Have a happy so Kids running to get their books. I don't know if Antoinette can hear us, Cynthia and Jen, but just have her say yeah. something about what reading can. means to these kids. For them to hold a brand new book yeah. and oh. bring it home, the pride that they'll have and the excitement they would have. It means a lot. They love to read. They enjoy it. Uh, they get excited when I push the card in and they get to choose a book. So this will help out even more. Oh, yes. For them to even and have a lot of these kids home. don't have books. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, a lot of them don't have books. So this will help. Wow. Well, that was, well, that was. It's a free book fair. Yes, yes. <laughs> Who we doesn't just love a book fair? Just say right. to you, Antoinette, this beautiful work that you're doing. It, it, we see you this morning. The whole country sees you out there every day pushing your cart, and you might not, you might think, what does it matter? Well, it matters. Yep. It's inspiring. Thank you. Coming up next, our girl Allie Love surprises the dance teacher who believed in her from the very beginning. Do not miss this one after the break.
Welcome back to The Boost. From dancing for the New York Knicks to gaining fame as a Peloton instructor, Allie Love has made a career of expressing herself and lifting up others through movement. Well, now Allie's going to introduce us to the woman who helped set it all in motion. I often say that dance is a form of communication for me. There were many years from when I was young, even at this age, where I can't express how I truly feel. So deep, so personal, and just so individual. When I was on stage, I could take risks. And dance provided me a way to be big, to be bold, to be confident, to be daring. Two, round through three. I met my first ballet teacher in high school, and her name was Ruth Reason. Two. And after my first class, Miss Ruth came up and she was like, you know what, we want to get you more ballet classes. And she gave me an address and she said, tell your parents, if you can, to come here on Saturday and we'll take care of everything else. And from there, I've never lost that space at the bar, that place at the bar where I feel a sense of belonging. My heart has been here and it's never stopped. Plie and finish. And Miss Ruth is a legend in my mind. She's taught over 7,000 dancers over the course of 35 years. But her instruction goes far beyond the dance studio. Miss Ruth is like a mom to all of us. She's helped build my confidence in dance and she's helped me like grow. Miss Ruth has probably been my biggest supporter here at Armor. Morally, physically, mentally, she's just always been there and a person for me to go to. Resist the air. For the past several years, I've been involved with Armor Dance Theater's scholarship program, which provides opportunity for youth to have access to quality dance at no cost. As a teenager, I was welcomed into the program. Head down two. With Miss Ruth in my corner, I was exposed to the possibility of what I could achieve. Growing up, I did not see dancers who looked like me. It allowed me to step out there and say, you know what, if there's going to be a first, why not me? That mentality stuck with me throughout my career in dance. And I wanted to go back and thank Miss Ruth for believing in me. All right, y'all, I am at Armor Dance Theater. I haven't been here for years, and I'm so excited because I'm going to surprise my former dance teacher and mentor, Miss Ruth. Front fist, front fist. And one, two, three, rush. <laughs> I can't even tell you how good it felt to be reunited with Miss Ruth. <laughs> the truth is that I wouldn't be who I am without you. You would. Miss Ruth came into my life at the right time. I remember at my freshman year in college, I was going to another summer intensive. It was not related to here. And I didn't have the means to buy extra tights or ballet shoes. And I called Miss Ruth and asked her if she could pay for it. And she did. She never left me. I always had you to figure it out, whether you knew that or not, in the back of my mind. I wasn't alone in the dance world because I had Miss Ruth. That's so important to us that, Sorry. <laughs> that we're always there because yeah. Again, they, they, they're seemingly such small things, but they're big things if they're out of your reach and you need them to accomplish your goal. Yeah. Thank you. To have a white ballet teacher look at me and say, you can be great when the ballet world is white, you can be ballet, it's huge, huge. I was like, well, if she said it, I can be it. Front and back and front. I just, I couldn't be prouder of her because Ali's carrying forth our mission and our vision. It takes one person to change your life and one person to believe in you. And she really believed in me. She believed that I could be the best part of myself. Chanel Jones got her own dance tutorial from a mom who turned a career setback into social media fame, getting her groove back and spreading joy on Instagram. I never met a dance floor I didn't like. Arning has been dancing her whole life. For her, it's as easy as one, two steps. You've been a lifelong dancer. Tell me how long you've been dancing. I actually started as a competitive baton twirler. And my baton teacher told me that in order to be a better twirler, I should take dance. And from day one, I loved it. 
Kelly danced her way through elementary and middle school before waltzing back to twirling in high school and college. I twirled for the University of Tennessee. I was a majorette for the Pride of the Southland Band. And Peyton Manning was my quarterback. Her passion for the art took her to the Chicago Bulls dance team, the Lovables. Fortunately, Michael Jordan had literally just left, so I missed wow. him. To live in Chicago by myself and make it on the Chicago Bulls dancing was a dream come true. An ACL tear for the third time forced Kelly to hang up her dancing shoes. Life moved on for Kelly. She got married, had two boys, and built a thriving career as a social media manager. But everything changed a year ago. We lost our biggest account, and that was my account. And so when that went away, I was lost, and I'm trying to figure out what, what am I supposed to do now? She did the only thing she knew how, get dancing. When did you get that itch? I was watching this uh, Justin Timberlake dance video, Can't Stop This Feeling video. I thought I'm gonna learn that and just put it up on Instagram and see what happens. After a slow start, Kelly's videos picked up steam, garnering more and more views. And then, Kelly started choreographing her own dance videos and posting them to Instagram. What followed was a barrage of dancers and non-dancers alike coming to her page for the way it made them feel. I just kept hearing that word, joy, joy. And I thought, you know what, this is bringing me joy. So I, I will absolutely keep doing it if it's bringing others joy as well. You're dancing in your house, by the pool, on the street. My street dances are actually a favorite. My husband actually films those. He never gives me any grief about it. What do you want the takeaway to be? Whatever that little spark in you is, find it and go and do it. I put my dancing shoes on to get a quick tutorial from the pro. You're gonna go out and cross. Out and cross and slide together. Hitchhike, hitchhike, John, Travolta, hoop and clap. Good teacher. So let's just try it with the music. After the break, it's not your run-of-the-mill clothing company. We have a whole lot more to give your day a boost coming up right after this.
We're back on The Boost introducing you to two friends turned business partners who are running a very different kind of company. They make athletic gear for your workout that also helps out the planet. It's our promise to make the world a better place through running. And how'd you come up with the name? We knew we wanted to use an apparel brand based in running, which is a sport that we love, to make a difference in the world. Active wear brand Janji is making waves with its commitment to expanding access to clean water, giving 2% of its proceeds to further the cause all around the globe, from the Philippines to Mexico to the American Southwest. Mike Bernstein and Dave Spandorfer started the company in 2012 and are approaching a major milestone. By the end of this year, we should have given our $1 million back toward water causes. This journey, beginning with an idea, sparked at a track meet in college. How do you decide we want to make a difference in the world and we want to do it through the lens of a running apparel line? It was the hottest recorded day in May history in Cleveland, Ohio. We had water on two sides of this track. Someone spraying us down, someone giving us these cups of water. And we had had experiences learning about the water crisis. It was during that track meet that this idea crystallized. They ran with that idea. Now, each season's collection focuses on one region, featuring designs of local artists. The company also partners with organizations on the ground to improve access to clean water. It's just one of these problems where it, it literally trickles down into so many facets of society. You have kids that are, are sick, so they're not able to go to school, they're not getting education, you have parents that aren't working, and if you can find a solution for that community, the impact is just immeasurable. Janji has even navigated uncharted waters by developing sustainable clothing. How is your apparel line different? We have multiple certifications to ensure that the product is produced the right way. 74% of our synthetics are made with recycled polyesters. And then we have a five-year run ever a guarantee that every single Janji product lasts a minimum of five years. And then we also have the first ever biodegradably enhanced synthetic running top. This shirt, which is made with polyester, it doesn't take 400 years to decompose. It is gone in a landfill in under four years. One of the big problems that adds to the landfill situation in, in this country and really around the world is there's so much production. The most important thing is avoiding pieces ending up in that landfill. And so on the one side, we make gear that lasts. On the other side, we're, we're very conscious of how much we make. We make very limited run collections so that when they sell out, they're gone. But at the same time, there's not excess pieces at the end of the season that we are throwing away. The duo hoping to continue turning the tide. Do you worry that some of these other companies kind of take notice and go, oh, we like what they're doing. We're going to do that. Look, if we, the big companies out there, decided they wanted to give 2% of their sales toward water projects, make things incredibly sustainable, have a five-year guarantee, work with artists, that's awesome. We would love to be an inspiration, not just for the big companies, but, but new entrepreneurs out there who are starting businesses and doing something really special with their time, with their energy, with their career, because we feel so lucky to be able to do this in the sport that we love and a way to see the world around us. Now to a marathon runner who's made remarkable strides to get where he is today, achieving a new personal best every time he competes. NBC's Kate Snow has his story. For Rasan Thomas, running feels like freedom. The native New Yorker training for the city's upcoming marathon after 22 years behind bars. My first marathon was in San Quentin State Prison. It was 105 laps around a prison yard. In 2000, Rasan was locked up for shooting and killing a man during a drug deal. But while facing a life sentence, he turned his own life around. In prison, Rasan got an associate's degree and started writing for the San Quentin News. It's something to be really proud of. He even co-hosted a podcast about prison life that was a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize. It's also where he met volunteer teacher Claire Gelbert. And we just sort of hit it off. All right, switch. The two made a pact to one day run the New York City Marathon. So you make this deal that it, when you get out, if you get out, you're we'll going to do it together. together. Yes. Uh, what's, what's up, James? What's up, man? Rasan's sentence was commuted by California's governor for dedicating himself to his rehabilitation, and he was released this February. 
You aren't healed up yet? He and Claire now running with a new mission for Empowerment Avenue, a group Rassan founded to help publish the work of incarcerated writers and artists. If you just treat people like human beings, you change their hearts, you change their minds. His hope to change the American prison system one step at a time. For people that hear you're running and hear your story and think, but wait a second, he killed someone. Yeah. What do you say to them? First I say, I'm sorry. And then I would say, um, I can't pay my debt sitting in the cell. If I can make people who once harmed society love society, that's the best way I can pay for my crimes. You can't ever undo the past. There's no way to restore that justice. The only thing I can do is pay it forward. Kate Snow, NBC News, New York. We've got more good news after the break. Do not go anywhere. Welcome back to The Boost. We've got another fun story for you. Check it out. For a second grade teacher named Rachel invited her boyfriend to come to her classroom to be the mystery reader for the day. So everything was totally normal. Then Austin surprised everybody with an extra page at the end of the book. And that page went a little bit like this. Now, as we approach this new stage of life, there is no question that I want you as my wife. Now there is something still missing. Yes, just one thing. And that is a beautiful radiant cut diamond ring. Okay, Austin, you did it. That's the greatest mystery reader of all time. You dropped down on one knee. Pop my question. Wow. The, seventh, the second graders, by the way, loved it. Oh, yeah. They gave their blessing, and Rachel, of course, said yes. Thank you so much for joining us for today. We hope we boosted your spirits, and we will see you tomorrow with more fun right here on Today All Day. Welcome to today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Back, here we go. Boom. Sometimes we just do things to help. That's our Hoda. Happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all. Welcome to Today All Day and our special building community. I'm Joe Fryer. You know, it's no secret that humans want to connect with each other, to be part of something bigger than themselves. And every day, people across this country are lending a hand to their neighbor, fostering that sense of belonging in many unique ways. For the next 30 minutes, we'll shine a light on these people and their stories. First up, a library like you have never seen before, one that lends tools instead of books, building a shared DIY community for one Northwest Seattle neighborhood. Take a look, here's Craig Melvin. 
craft supplies, sewing machines, paint supplies, gear, sanders. Welcome to the Northeast Seattle Tool Library. It's a lending library of some 8,000 tools from automotive to landscaping to hand and power tools of every sort. Josh Epstein is a full-time coordinator here. A tool library is a place where people can come and get tools and they borrow them just like a book library, bring them back when they're done. Yeah. Sweet, Thank have you. a good one. You too. Like many of its 2,000 members, Josh first found the tool library because of a home renovation project he needed some help with. I was converting my garage into living space and needed scaffolding, like huge scaffolding, which could be thousands of dollars if you're even just renting it, let alone buying it. And they had 20 foot scaffolding here and I was just amazed. Got all that and was able to convert this garage, learning mostly from YouTube and some friends. That kind of do-it-yourself attitude is at the core of this community. Maya Altshuler, now a sophomore at Smith College, has been in the process of converting an old school bus into a tiny home with a whole lot of help from the tool library. It's fun to say that my first car is a bus. We stripped out all the seats, replaced the flooring, put in cabinets. It would be really cool to get it to a place where I could potentially live in it full time if I wanted to. Pick a board, cut a 90 and a 45. I want to empower somebody to do something they never thought they could do. Do you feel okay? Yeah, I did. Okay. Members also have access to a wood shop where Trisha Sillis is a shop steward. She's one of the 100 volunteers that keep this community space going yes. strong. And she's looking to break stereotypes about who works with tools. Members do look at me for advice. They don't look past me for the advice. They actually engage me and being dismissed as that older woman who probably doesn't know, that's uh, not true. <laughs> there are about 50 independent tool libraries like this one spread throughout the country with different membership models. At this Seattle library, they have an optional yearly donation, but membership is free and open to all. A surprising number of them are in very good condition. Recycling and reuse are at the core of what tool libraries do. Carl Coney is one of the many volunteer repair people on site tasked with keeping the tools in rotation for as long as possible. I've always prided myself on fixing things rather than replacing them. Everybody doesn't need to have a pressure washer if they only use it four times a year. Uh, so having a place where they can just come in and then take whatever they want for their project uh, that makes real environmental sense. It's a lot of stuff that doesn't have to be manufactured and then disposed of. We know that there's environmental problems going on right now. We know that communities are getting less connected and we know that people are needing to save money right now. And so we're doing all those things. This is a movement that is really actually building a lot of momentum right now. We're getting this done and talking about the future of how we want to grow and change the world through the two libraries. Next up, we head to the middle of the country to learn about a business built on second chances. In St. Louis, Missouri, the Laughing Bear Bakery offers formerly incarcerated people a job and a serving of compassion. Laughing Bear Bakery in St. Louis is not your typical bakery. It's a place that believes in second chances. They have volunteers, but the paid employees all share one thing in common, a criminal record. Candy up. It all started with the bakery's founder, Kaylin McAllister, a prison chaplain at the Farmington Correctional Center. Guys would come to me about two weeks before they were released, and they would say, hey chap, we don't even want to get out of prison, because if we get out, nobody will hire us, we'll recommit, we'll be back in prison. The employment numbers for ex-offenders are staggering. Those who've been to federal prison have a 60% jobless rate and 27% of people who've been to state prison are unemployed. I made a promise to the guys. I said, you know, when I retire, I'm gonna do something about this. I'm gonna create a business where we only hire ex-offenders. I put an outreach to people. I collected a whole $2,000 worth of donations. And Laughing Bear Bakery was born the mission to give a clean slate to the formerly incarcerated. 
you can encounter a lot of rejection, a lot of criticism. People talk bad or down about you or about ex-prisoners in general. And so it's a lot to overcome that. LaWanda, who asked us to withhold her last name for privacy, left prison in 2021 and eagerly took a position at Laughing Bear. It's like a lifeline to me. No one should be thrown away, no one. And so it made me feel like I was like reborn almost. Regular customer Kathy Vogel doesn't just come in for the bakery's famous bear candy, it's the people that keep her coming back. When you walk in the door, she's a ray of sunshine. She sings, she's happy, you know, and always ready to feed you with a smile. You got poppies, we might still have some smoke. It's fun when I get to interact with customers. I like when they order and then they say, you made this? I like this. I'm like, thank you, you know? I like it when they're happy. Kaylin and the team at Laughing Bear have created a community that focuses on the future instead of their past. When you come out of prison, you're lost. You don't have anybody to talk to about your experience. And they can talk to each other. They understand where they're coming from. They share things. They support each other. Support that works. Laughing Bear Bakery says 7% of the 43 ex-offenders who've worked here since 2015 have reoffended and returned to prison. Compare that to the nearly 50% statewide who reoffend within the first five years. As its popularity surged, Laughing Bear started to outgrow its small rental kitchen, so Kaylin turned to the community for help. We did a big fundraiser. People stepped up to the plate. This is not just me. This is a, a big community coming together to make this happen. Thanks to those donations, Laughing Bear was able to buy a storefront last July, becoming a permanent fixture of the community. It means everything to Kaylin, but it means everything to us too. Lawanda plans to continue Laughing Bear's mission to serve second chances by helping those who follow in her footsteps. You have to want to give that back. You have to want to help someone else. You have to want to be a part of that process. You just do. What a special community. Thank you so much to the folks at the Laughing Bear Bakery for letting us tell their amazing story. After the break, we'll explore how sports can bring people together by introducing you to a brand that's building Native American representation in skateboarding. Welcome back. For the last 20 years, Apache Skateboards has worked tirelessly to build a brand that represents the Native American community. We caught up with the founders to learn more about how they're strengthening their culture through their board designs, while also fostering a love of the sport. Craig Melvin has their story. I think the role of art in Apache culture has always been important because we made art for one another. When I made Doug, I painted his skateboard. I remember thinking, well, a hundred years ago, I would have made him a bow and arrow, but now I made him a skateboard. The seed for Apache skateboards was planted 20 years ago when a young Doug Miles Jr. asked his dad for a special gift. 
We were at the mall. He said, Dad, he goes, I need a board, and my board is broken. I didn't have enough money for a name brand skateboard with art on it. I said, son, I'll buy you the blank one, and I'll paint it when I get home. I painted an Apache Warrior on there. When he got home, he said, Dad, everybody wants one. And so, Apache Skateboards was born. It resonated because at the time, they made us feel proud. We want to see ourselves on the skateboards. As an artist, Doug Miles Sr. hoped his designs could teach others about his culture. Telling the story of Apache history was important. The struggle that Apache people had to deal with in America hasn't really been talked about from an Apache perspective. The Apache point of view is extremely important. I'm just one person, and it's just one skateboard. And even though I may be just scratching the surface, it was a good, fun way to encourage kids to learn more about their history. As the company has grown, so has the popularity of the sport in Native American communities. I think skateboarding is popular because you get to express yourself in all types of different ways, whether it's painting, art, music, filmmaking, because skateboarding is all of those things. You know, as a father, watching Doug become the skateboarder that he is, uh, it's almost unfathomable for me because I'm an artist, but his art is on the skateboard. And when I look at him skateboarding, I always think to myself, he is literally reshaping space and creating new uses for space out here on the res. Today, the father and son team are on a mission to increase access to skate parks on reservations. In these Native American communities, there's not a skate park on every reservation. And when there are skate parks, they don't take it for granted. Shaping and strengthening their community along the way. And I think that's this thing that keeps calling us home. It keeps uh, causing us to be creative in our own community. When we are building the community, you know, it's for the future. Doug Miles isn't just skate rad and skate cool. Doug Miles is living and working and skating in his own communities. With every grind, Doug Jr. is carving a path for the next generation to follow. I think that when you can see someone doing something in the same place as you, you kind of have a little more hope and say, hey, I could do this too. Um, this is possible for me. When you can walk in through the door first, you can open the door, people can follow you through. And our thanks to Craig for that great story. Now, let's go running. You know, many people think of it as a solo endeavor, each runner on their own journey. But we have an incredible story of one man who conquered his first New York City Marathon this year, encouraged by the running community he discovered in the Bronx, New York. Jorge Aguilar calls the path ahead of him an obstacle of his own choosing. Any nerves at all? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah right here in my belly. There, there's a burst of butterflies in there. As scary as that 26.2 mile course may sound, Jorge will tell you it's far better than the obstacles that were not of his own choosing. The ones he faced after moving from Costa Rica to the Bronx when he was seven. I thought we were going to the, the land of, of the Simpsons and Mickey Mouse, um, but it was tougher. Those obstacles seemed endless. He and his mom were poor. Jorge was bullied because he didn't speak English. He even faced the threat of deportation. You know, I, got, I got jumped and robbed several times as a kid. That stuff carries with you into adulthood, doesn't it? It does. It, it leaves scars. Mental scars that finally started to heal when Jorge started to run. About three years ago, he joined a running club, the Boogie Down Bronx Runners, located in the same borough where he now works as a child psychiatrist. And it's so meaningful. You could have moved to another neighborhood. Why not? I don't want to work anywhere else. Uh, there's no greater need for, for mental health services, I think, than here. The Bronx is also where Jorge has been training. I once ran 18 miles on this track. Oh my goodness. Isn't that crazy? How many loops around is that? <laughs> Too many. <laughs> he can't wait to run through his hometown borough, which he'll reach during mile 20 of the marathon. I think I'm gonna cry. <laughs> I think I'm gonna cry, Joe. Um, <laughs> I, it's gonna be on my mind for the first 19 miles of the race. 
Can't wait to get to the Bronx, where it all started. Jorge now looks forward to the route ahead, knowing the toughest road is already behind. Along the course, Jorge had the support of his wife and his two-year-old son, Miguel. He finished all 26.2 miles with an official time of three hours, 38 minutes, and 48 seconds. After the break, a story about young women coming together, learning to love themselves fully, including the natural state of their hair. From curls to coils to kinks, rocking natural hair can be a way for black women to express themselves and celebrate their heritage. In Atlanta, Georgia, some of these women are creating safe spaces for each other to embrace who they truly are. Take a look. Chanel Jones has their story. We don't have a lot of role models to tell us what's beautiful about ourselves. And rentals like this are important because it's representation. Everybody needs representation. I remember this experience. I feel like it's actually really life-changing. At the Black Hair Experience in Atlanta, Georgia, nostalgia and self-love reign supreme. Each room, each booth has a different story to tell. You see how people went through in their past, like the 90s. But for many black women, including sisters Gabrielle and Gabrielle Francis, the story of how they came to embrace their hair is complicated. Growing up, I always felt like my hair was unique, but I also, I guess I didn't love it as much as I should have. I used to see people with braids and with wigs and like with their hair straight in. And like, I used to want to do the same thing. I felt like my confidence would come from my hair being like theirs. The girls attended the Black Hair Experience on a field trip hosted by the mental health advocacy group, Black Girls Smile. Lauren Carson founded the organization in 2012 and since then has impacted over 10,000 young women nationwide. What we try to focus on with Black Girls Smile with all of our programs, all of our events is just really making sure young black women feel safe, they feel protected and they feel supported to really focus on how to lead a mentally healthy life. The baddies have bad days and sad days too. And we want them to know when that happens, what are the tools that they can pull on to feel good about their physical self, but also to make sure mentally that they're doing well. The relationship between hair and mental health is one that Black Girl Smile is currently helping young women navigate. Too long it has been a standard of beauty that does not fit for a lot of young Black women. And if everything around having good hair is tied to being as close to whiteness as possible and appearing a certain way to align with this kind of dominant narrative around what hair should look like, what hair should be like, then we're still feeding into this oppressive system. The natural hair journey has been this reclaiming of like our inherent worth. There are ways to empower ourselves through our hair. 
I know that when I'm struggling with my mental health and well-being and a lot of people, you don't care about your image. And in many cases, people don't always see that as a warning sign, but it is a warning sign that someone's struggling with their mental health or well-being. While at the Black Hair Experience, Lauren and Paige invited clinical psychologist Dr. Ayana Abrams to lead the women and girls in a conversation dedicated to understanding the ways the relationship with their hair impacts their well-being. Right now, I just want you to close your eyes and I want you to touch your hair. And I want you to really connect with what you're feeling. I want you to all come into this room where you're safe, where you're seen, where you're heard. For the girls, the importance of gathering in sisterhood rang true. Some people are criticized very harshly because of their hair, and they might not have somebody who they can relate to. So having groups like this would give them a chance to connect with other people and not feel like alone in the world. And for the Francis sisters, being a part of this community has been life affirming. I tend to help people more than I help myself and I tend to put everyone first before I put myself first. The Black Girl Smile has helped me learn that if I'm not strong for myself, then I can't be strong for anyone else. I would not be here if it was not for Black Girl Smile. Seriously, I really would not. Every single time we have a meeting, I'm like, hey, like, you've done so much in my life and I don't even think you understand how much. Like, you empowered me to be a better person. I feel like I've been able to find myself. Now to Memphis, Tennessee. The city is known for its blues, its barbecue, and its famous Beale Street. It's also home to a vibrant and unfortunately vulnerable transgender community that faces social and economic challenges. That's where my sister's house has stepped in. It's an organization working to change these realities by building homes for trans black women in the community. It's a city known for its barbecue and blues, but just minutes from the hustle and bustle of Beale Street, Memphis, Tennessee is also home to a vibrant yet vulnerable transgender community that faces social and economic challenges. We're in the Bible Belt of the South, and it's a, it's a red state in terms of housing access and discrimination, employment access and discrimination. There's no real legal protections for trans people. Nationally, one in five trans individuals is said to have experienced homelessness at some point in their life, and nearly a third live in poverty. Those figures are even higher when you account for race. I was born and raised here in Memphis, Tennessee. When Kayla Gore was just 23 and newly transitioning, she experienced homelessness while living 1,500 miles from the city where she grew up. It was very, very scary. After returning to Memphis, she entered a transitional housing program and began working without Memphis, the local LGBTQ community center. During that time, Kayla says she started to see a lot of trans and queer people kicked out of their homes at the age of 18, some rejected by their families. While there are services for individuals experiencing home insecurity in Memphis, many are faith-based. There's lots of anti-LGBTQ rhetoric, and more importantly, a lot of those shelters are separated by sex assigned at birth. You're forced into a situation of either outing yourself or staying closeted in an environment where you could be incredibly unsafe. There's also a lot of trans folks of color here, so then you also kind of double down with racism. They have a lot stacked up against them. The pandemic exacerbated that. A survey by the Trevor Project found last year more than 80% of trans and non-binary youth said COVID-19 led to a more stressful living situation. Hoping to change that, Kayla, who'd been able to purchase her own home, which she shared with others who found themselves experiencing homelessness, founded My Sister's House. We wanted to provide like a space where people can thrive and they can actually start to grow um, and heal the trauma that they had you know, experienced in their youth. Originally a word of mouth program, my sister's house aimed to provide emergency services and shelter to trans and queer people of color. It's for us by us, like it's trans people at the helm of it and it's from a perspective of someone who's been there. I was homeless as a youth, so I, I remember what it was like being vulnerable. As my sister's house evolved, so did their mission. Now the group is aiming to build 20 homes for trans women in Memphis. It's safe to say that I did not come from a background of building houses or working with plumbing and electrical, uh, but it is safe to say that I came from a family that had really love and compassion for the community that they live in. Originally planning to build tiny homes, they're now <laughs> renovating existing homes because of the rising costs of everything, including lumber. 
Using a lottery of individuals they previously helped, recipients get more than a shelter. They actually own the house. It's a different feeling when you um, have your own place. Jeanette Adams moved into her home just a few months ago. It's a tiny house, but it, you know, it's big to me. Jeanette had been living with her mom and has a supportive family, but being able to live on her own has boosted her confidence. I felt free. A lot of people, especially trans women, we don't get a chance to own anything. Kayla says that's exactly what she's hoping to provide those selected to receive a house. Trans people are boxed out of economics in so many different ways that we have to build our own economics. This is how people built generational wealth 100 years ago where their families had small homes. So it's nothing new that we're doing. It's just that we're doing a unique thing for a community that really deserves it. Just a couple miles from Jeanette's home, crews are replacing the electrical system at another property. This will be our fifth house that will be occupied. Modi James will soon call this two-bedroom home her own sanctuary. I'm ecstatic about it because it would be mine. If my, it would be my home, not my house. Modi says she does not feel safe in her current living arrangement. I've been trying to get a home on my own. They take you through the ringer and they're expensive. I see nothing and I live nothing but poverty. I'm trying to overcome it. LGBTQ advocates in Memphis say my sister's house is giving people more than a place to live. It also created visibility and hope and inspiration for the trans community and for trans people of color here in the South that just wasn't there before. If I had the opportunity to receive the resources that we provide today, I couldn't imagine what my life would be like. Kayla hopes to expand and replicate what my sister's house has done in other cities. But she also hopes the program has something of an expiration date. I would want the legacy of my sister's house to be that we came, we conquered, and we disappeared because we no longer were needed. What amazing work Kayla and my sister's house are doing down in Memphis. We hope you've enjoyed our Today All Day special building community. For more stories like the ones that you've been watching, tune in to Today All Day. Greetings, everyone. The holidays are upon us, and we are ready to celebrate right here on Today All Day. From tips for that turkey to cooking up your very first holiday spread, we have got you covered. So tune in to Today All Day, all season long. back with today wellness and you know the old saying you are what you eat well 
It's especially true when it comes to brain function, apparently. Your brain in charge of keeping your heart beating, lungs breathing, allowing you to move, feel, and think. <laughs> yeah, the brain's real important. Yeah. <laughs> so to keep your brain in peak working condition, we're going to tell you about five foods to add to your diet to help improve memory, energy levels, and sleep. Dr. Taz Batia is an integrative wellness physician and host of the Superwoman Wellness Podcast. But this is for everybody. Dr. Yes. Taz, good morning. Good morning. So you're saying before we get to it that, that if you start incorporating these into your diet, you'll see results relatively quickly? The beauty about kind of getting your diet right is usually within three weeks, oh. you can see a change and it can be as quiet as you have more sleep and you have more energy to like you're on and you're focused and ready to go. Wow. What is about these foods that we're going to look at here? What is about these particular foods and, and other items that give the brain that boost? Well, what, why we have picked these foods is because we call them superfoods. They just have a ton of nutrients for every serving. Okay. So they're, su they're efficient, right? So if you're trying to get these nutrients in, this is an efficient way to do it to keep your brain and your energy superpower. All right, our first super ingredient is yes. magnesium. Where do we find that? So magnesium, I always call the miracle micronutrient. It helps us with sleep, it helps calm us down, it helps balance serotonin. Try that. Believe so it or not, dark chocolate is gonna uh -huh. be one of our best sources. An ounce of it has about 64 milligrams of magnesium okay. in it. Legumes are great. They come in at about 70 milligrams. A tablespoon of flax, which you see right here, mm -hmm. at about 40. Avocado also has magnesium, but less than the dark chocolate. So you, you have this recipe, these little balls, what are in those then? So it's a lot of cacao, which has a lot of the magnesium mm -hmm. and the antioxidants in it, almond butter for the healthy fats, flax seeds, mm -hmm. mix it up together, super easy, has a little bit of oat too. A little dark chocolate in there. A little dark there. chocolate in there. So it's, it's yummy, yummy, right? Yeah. Yeah. And not too much calories no, either, Not too many it? calories. No. So we have a chocolate Let's craving, calories. you go for Let's it. Let's talk collagen here. Because yes. collagen, you say, is, it's actually naturally occurring in our bodies. We all have it. We've all got collagen. It's naturally occurring. We know it for skin and health, hair and overall health but it actually helps support the gut lining, helping us to absorb the nutrients. So, so many people are eating healthy, but they're not absorbing what they're eating. Collagen comes in and helps us with that, helps the brain, helps energy. It's in a lot of naturally occurring proteins. So we've got salmon here, for example, and chicken. You know, these are things that are a great way to get salmon in. This looks like chicken this stock. Is, How would you use it? This is bone broth. Bone so broth. Some people oh. will just drink bone broth and get a great Roker, source Roker of collagen. Doesn't. Try a swig. Roker does Wash that. And then if you're, if you're vegetarian, you can get some collagen from your vegetables as well. It's just that we get a lot more through our proteins and through our bone broth. Uh, I, I, these are cruciferous. Those can are cruciferous. you only get the collagen from cruciferous? Not vegetables? necessarily. No, no, you can get it from other vegetables as well. It's just not as dense. All right, this is a new one on me. Choline. What is that? Why is it good? So choline, I feel like, doesn't get enough press, and I'm so glad <laughs> we're talking about it today. So choline actually is a nutrient that comes in and coats all our nerves. So it helps us with learning, Never with memory, that. with hmm. focus. And we really want to get choline in our diet. So choline is naturally found in eggs. Eggs are one of the best sources, but you've got to eat the egg yolk. Okay. The yolk has the choline, has about 140 milligrams. We've got mushrooms and burgers here. Which one do you think has more choline? Mushrooms. Mushrooms. You guys win. Good job. So mushrooms actually have more choline How than How many a eggs would you have to eat or mushrooms? Like what's a serving to get enough choline any so given day? Just, this is the beauty of eggs. One full egg, including oh. the yolk, will okay. do it. You need a cup of mushrooms. You actually need two burgers to get the choline. <laughs> Ooh, I love holy. Mushroom, yeah. Mushrooms and eggs, I guess. There yeah. we go. This, mushroom is, burger. this is something I've never heard of. Oh, ghee. I've heard of this. I've it's like butter or something? Ghee is uh, it's like butter. That's a great way to think about it. It's clarified butter. It's been used in Eastern systems of medicine for a really long time. And it's been used as a healing fat. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because ghee actually has less lactose, less casein. So if you've got somebody that's dairy intolerant, yeah. can't tolerate that stuff, they can usually tolerate ghee very well. But the secret superfood ingredient here is MCT, or medium chain triglycerides that helps the brain it helps the gut it balances everything living down here in the mm. gut and that is really the powerhouse the source of our energy so if we're not getting some of these healthy fats in that's one of the biggest reasons I see brain and energy start to go down. how do you get ghee in your diet I'm not looking to yes like a big old no bite we don't want that. you we and we don't want you to you do put that it on toast you can put it on toast literally all you need is about a quarter to a oh, half wait, of a teaspoon. Sure that, a tiny little bit a tiny little teaspoon you don't need okay. a lot and you can spread it on something you, it also has has a higher smoke point, so you can bake and fry with it oh, as well. Okay. So you can use it as butter. Exactly. All I right. see artichokes and I see tea. 
Milk yes. thistle. Milk thistle. Okay, so this is now something that is not naturally occurring. This is an herb. It comes. Milk thistle is an herb. It comes from a flowering plant, but it has so many great benefits in supporting liver health. The liver is something again we don't talk about very much. Our livers work pretty hard. <laughs> yes, sure. Between alcohol and between just the environment, right? We get a lot of burden to our liver. So it's naturally occurring in artichokes, but an easier way to get Dr. it in Taz, is to get the tea in. All right, you know this feeling. Your brain is exhausted, but you. Still have a hundred things left to do on your to-do list and the only thing you can think about is taking a nap. I feel that. Well, today we are beating back brain fog and fighting fatigue with the one and only nutritionist health expert. Jo I'm going to give another her another way. Joy you Bauer. Been, your friend, all roads lead through Stephanie Rule. I just realized you yeah. guys have been friends for a while Joy too. Joy Bauer and I hadn't met. I called her during COVID yeah. and I said, I Help need me. some health advice. I am home with my kids all day, eating, baking, eating, baking. And, and she did. And what a great Perfect. student she is. And she oh did my what gosh. you suggested. Everything. And you Everything. don't deprive, which is the key Ever. piece of it. Ever. All right. Let's talk about getting our energy back. We need our mojo. Yeah. And I think, like, having more energy is something everyone yeah, wants sure. more of. And believe it or not, having more energy during the day actually traces back to getting a good night's sleep. And okay. here's why. It is so important to get a solid night's sleep. And that is seven to nine hours a night. Because when you go to sleep, your body slows down your metabolism mm -hmm. and conserves energy. And mm -hmm. we know through research, when you conserve energy, that next day, our cells are more energy efficient. So they ignite more readily and you have more energy. So this is what we're going to start with. So, so get some good sleep. The yeah, enemy. So, so the again, enemy. <laughs> well, but here, this is something really cool. You, you can roll in the sheets, but you cannot scroll in the sheets. And here's mm -hmm. why. Cute, Joy. <laughs> I'm not looking for either one. Just FYI. <laughs> I'm a hard pass on both. Yeah. We like our sleep. <laughs> so, so here's the thing. When it's dark and you're laying down to get a good night's sleep, if you have your smartphone or your iPad mm -hmm. or a computer, the blue light that emanates off the screen is going to interfere with melatonin production. Yeah. Melatonin is a very important hormone that's released mm -hmm. in the brain that promotes sleepiness. So right. if you interfere with that production, you're okay. not going to be able to fall asleep. So get rid, get rid of, of the all phone. of Wear the, the screens. Yes. All right, let's yes. talk about foods. So the winning formula when it comes to food mm -hmm. is protein plus fiber plus healthy fat. And here's why. Okay. The three things together steady your blood sugars okay. and will leave you feeling sustained with your energy levels. Very, very important. So I'm showing some breakfast options here. Mm -hmm. Greek yogurt with some fresh fruit. I Why love Greek it. yogurt? Because Greek yogurt has more than twice the amount of protein as traditional yogurt. And by the way, traditional yogurt is still good because it has some protein, but Greek yogurt has loads of protein. So is the sweetness, it comes from the fruit, not from like honey or something else? Well, if you, you, can, you can get a plain Greek yogurt mm -hmm. and then be in control of how much sweet you put mm -hmm. in. I would say one teaspoon of maple syrup or honey is okay, okay. but if you can omit that and just really sweeten it up with juicy, fabulous, wholesome fruit, Cause, that's... Because the sugar makes you go high and low exactly too. okay and so this is an apple or a banana with nut butter can we just look how at this did you swirl? put this on how I didn't like Anthony stop this, did it stop this. he's what? like a genius yeah and so the apple provides juicy fiber and complex carbohydrates and loads of nutrition and the nut butter whether whether it's peanut butter or cashew butter or almond butter or soy nut butter whatever butters we love all the butters yeah. it's got the healthy fat and the protein mm -hmm. and this is oatmeal for fiber and seeds and nuts see we have almonds here right. I love pumpkin seeds so are those, what about chia seeds? Are those important? Chia seeds are great. Good. Okay. Chia seeds are great. Yeah. All right. Take us to the beverage department. Okay. I'm going to just say this is great. I don't <laughs> even know what it is. I am so excited. Take a sip of this. What is it? I made a healthy, no sugar added frappuccino. Wait, it's coffee? Okay, that's the list. Yes. So I added a shot of espresso, mm. and then there's a frozen banana, I some can taste ice, the banana. It's yummy. cocoa powder for brain boosting what? compounds, and a little bit of milk. Almond milk is in this mm. one. So it's a dairy free version. It's light in it calories, tastes, and it gives you a jolt. It, it feels like a dessert. Isn't it? Yummy. Great? All it's right, great. what about just drinking water? Mm. And, and so water mm. hydration is very important, crazy important. If you're slightly dehydrated, yeah. you're going to feel fatigue. So everybody says, how much water do I need? The mm. first thing is it doesn't have to be plain water. It could be sparkling water. Coffee and tea count towards your hydration. Oh, they do? Yes, oh. as does okay. milk. Are so, you good about drinking water? Um, yes, I am. It's one of the Naturally things I... Naturally or yeah. disciplined uh, about? Well, I am disciplined, but I, tr I drink probably like six of those bottles a day. 
little That's ones. That's amazing. Yeah. So, so your, your actions are passing? No. Really? Because you got to chug it, man. So you can't just when just it's down. When it's room temperature yeah. or you have a straw, you could suck it down yeah. more easily. What if you like it cold? Good. Ice water is like a 10 in terms of taste. Room temperature is like a 4. So you only like ice water? Correct. Do you drink a lot of it? No, I do not. See? And I need to. Okay. Yeah. You'll like this guy. So this what is, is this? a spa water. Here. I just added some lemon slices and cucumber and mm -hmm. some herbs. So it jazzes it up. It gives a little bit of pizzazz so it's yeah. more flavorful. You don't like it. And here's no, a I great do. rule no, of thumb. Like you take your weight, <laughs> divide it in half. So let's say you weigh 140 pounds. That's 70 ounces of water you should strive for every single day. Okay. And, and what... <laughs> Do you I'm like just, it? I'm, I do. do you like it? I, I'm, I know how, how little water I drink, so I'm trying and to get my reps in. These, by the way, guys, I these? made you a batch of my chocolate energy muffins. So these are light and they're fluffy and they're super delicious and moist, but I added in hmm. some espresso. So you get a shot, a little bit of a jolt, and oh, we're going to put this on Real the good. website. Great. Yeah. Joy, thank you. It's good to see you here. Uh, you can Always. get that, oh. that energy muffin recipe today.com slash food. Love you, Joy. Love you, Hope. better today and one reason you could be fatigued is maybe due to what you're eating or maybe rather what you're not oh, we eating. No, so Dr. Amy Shaw is renowned for her extensive knowledge on gut health. She's also the author of the new book, I'm so effing tired. <laughs> uh oh, I didn't know you could say that. A proven plan to beat burnout, boost your energy and reclaim your life. Dr. Shaw, welcome. Thank you so much for having me to both of you. Oh, well, thank you. So Dr. Shaw, what, what do you think is the biggest complaint. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody is tired. I think yeah. this year has made people tired. Right. But what do you yeah. hear from your patients? That is the number one thing I hear. I'm so effing tired. The title of the book. For far too long, women's concerns about why we're so tired have been dismissed. I mean, it, maybe it's because we're getting older or because we're put, you know, we're not trying hard enough. But I knew there's more than that. So I really looked into it further. It's about, you know, what we're eating, when we're eating and stress management. All right, well, let's talk about then that then, because we know, like I know for myself, if I eat like a piece of salmon and broccoli before I go yes. to bed, and if I wake up the next day, I, I feel better. You're gonna feel great. I always feel yes. better. Yeah. So this is about, so what are the things we should be putting into our body that will help us rest and also have more energy in the next day? It's true. I mean, we can all relate to how tempting it is to have the sweets right yeah. before bed, and especially when we're so tired. But these are not the energy fixes we actually want, especially when we eat them or drink them close to bed. We actually want to be rebuilding our gut health, our immune health, our hormone health, this energy trifecta, uh, interconnected way that we get energy. So you want to be eating foods that build up that gut bacteria that gets damaged. With just two nights of sleep, you damage the good gut bacteria. Um, so you really want to rebuild Wait. that when, you, when you're when you chronically sleep deprived. Something oh. like, you know, Jerusalem artichokes, broccoli, asparagus, 
ginger, onions, garlic, yams. These are amazing ways to feed that good gut bacteria with prebiotic fiber. Okay, so if you have two bad nights of sleep, yeah. your gut health can, can yeah. you know, there's the... Deteriorate. Can yeah. deteriorate. So what yeah. are some foods mm -hmm. that are bad, too, for the gut health? And yeah. probably it also connects with sleeping. I, I assume if yeah. you're eating something that's not good for your gut yeah. health, you're also not sleeping as well. Yes. Things, you you know, when you're tired, you really want to automate your meals. You want to be getting some bright sunlight yeah. to wake you up and then eat some automated breakfast that you love, like a prebiotic breakfast bar or a smoothie bowl, like a green smoothie bowl here with berries. You really want to automate your meals and eat things that are going to be good for that gut bacteria so you can rebuild that energy trifecta, the hormones, the immune system, and the gut, the very base of how we get our energy. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the title of your book is I'm So Effing Tired, and I think a lot of people are feeling that. Um, and I know this is a little off point, but other than the foods yeah. that we should be eating, what? Mm -hmm. do, how do you advise your patients? Because we want more energy in the morning. We want to feel good throughout the course of the day. Sometimes it's lack of sleep, but sometimes it's other stuff too. Yeah, I feel that too. So we have an internal clock called circadian rhythms and syncing your body with circadian rhythms is one of the most effective ways to get sustained natural energy and fix that energy trifecta. Something like getting natural sunlight for mm -hmm. a few minutes mm -hmm. in the morning, mm -hmm. something like not eating before bed two hours, it's called circadian intermittent fasting. So you know we are supposed to be doing things in light and dark. Right. So really sticking with that. And then what you had mentioned before in the show, not maybe not not having the screens right before bed, maybe even just 30 minutes uh, screenless yeah. time and so get a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. Quickly, will you just tell us the foods we should avoid right before yeah. bed and yeah. the foods we should be eating? Yes, before bed, you don't want to be eating a lot of chocolate, yep. a lot of wine. I mean, one glass is good, but you know, people just think three glasses is better. That's not the case. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to be having your coffee late at night. Even though, you know, tea is one of the most antioxidant, anti-inflammatory foods, you don't want to have caffeine right before bed. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes without saying, but mm -hmm. there's a few foods that can help you sleep, induce melatonin, the mm -hmm. melatonin, the sleep hormone that gets released two to three hours before bed. So tart, dark uh, cherries, uh, tart cherries, oh. mm -hmm. um, olives are a really great yeah, way to induce melatonin. And nuts who doesn't love their nuts, oh, nuts. and seeds so okay. something that you can snack on a few hours before bed okay awesome well, thank you dr. thank you Shaw. so much dr it. sean you can check out dr shaw's book at today.com Kids back in school, you're going to need some healthy afternoon snacks to help them power through because they got to do their homework. No, they have to do their homework, and there is no one better 
than busy mom of four and seriously delicious author Siri Daly. Yes, back to school homework. I mean, we were just talking. My son is in high school now, How is so that like possible? the homework game has just you know up. gone up to here. But I think the problem with snacks are you eat a snack and then you're exhausted after. You need something that keeps that, your energy yes. up. Yes. So this one is my favorite for okay. that because okay. apples. I, I've actually once heard that apples give you more energy than co than coffee. I don't oh. know if that's true, but these are well, really I really Hoda loves an apple. Wonderful. She eats an apple a day. An apple yeah, day. My, yeah, my my kids night. love apple and peanut butter. So these are okay. like a fun little way to have apple and peanut butter you make a little sandwich so you're going to core out your apple i like mm -hmm. using you know granny smith but you can use any apple and then tart. when you oh, yeah okay. they're yeah. so good with peanut butter that tart and is creamy. it weird for me to ask how you make the circle so perfect well i like using an apple core oh there's um, a machine um, for there that. is a machine mm -hmm. um, I, I suggest yeah it's it's much easier than okay. you know using a knife and trying to do it okay. yourself but um okay so then, you just paint this yeah and butter? then like i like granola. to use a little granola for texture mm -hmm. um of course my kids like Chocolate chips. Oh, yeah, I'm like, you know, like, why not? They're having something healthy here. Right. So, mm -hmm. but these are golden raisins. If if your kids like raisins, mm -hmm. um, and then you just make a little sandwich. That's such a cute, and easy you, idea. You can easily easy, have them ready peasy. for when they get home, and it's just really yummy. I eat them too. Yummy. Um, yeah. Love so that's it. one snack. Okay. okay now another really here. really great peanut butter snack are okay. these frozen banana bites. So banana. you're gonna Yum. take a I'm banana. Into this. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you're gonna just slice them into little rounds, and then you're gonna make you. Can make so a sandwich you, if you want. Did you freeze these first? Not yet. No, okay. these are regular. regular. And then you make little sandwiches, but then you're going to freeze them for about an hour until okay, right they get there. firm before you dip them in chocolate. Okay. So over here, we have chocolate that is melted with a tiny little bit of coconut oil. Oh, which oh will, do you need the oil? You don't need it, but what will what that will do is it will harden the chocolate quicker and mm. it also just makes it like nice and shiny Creamy like and this. Shiny, yeah. So should we dip some? Yes. Oh and then, I know, they're so good. They, you, you can dip it all the way or halfway, whatever you want. And then do you dip it um, in something else? And then, else? you know, just to make it fun, you can add sprinkles, you can add graham crackers, chopped peanuts, whatever you want, and then store them in the freezer and they'll, you know, they'll last for like a week These or two. These are delicious. Yeah, they're so yummy. Um, and the, again, just a great, I like, love that. Um, and you know what? They're delicious with or without the chocolate. Yeah, you don't need the oh, chocolate. Oh, really? I just or you can do some bananas like some that. of this. Yeah. Okay, I'm in. I love peanut butter and banana too. I mean, Me too. Right. I'm yeah. really happy with that. Okay, and our <laughs> third snack. Um, my daughter Etta loves nachos, but I try so to get I. her to do like some protein with the nachos mm -hmm. because all she does is eat you know, carbs yeah. and cheese all day long. Me too. So this is a little um, tortilla that I've made into a round with like a cookie cutter, like oh. a three inch cookie mm. cutter. Okay. And then we're gonna put it in these muffin tins that are lightly greased. Look and how, you just look at make the shape a little it makes. shape, like mm -hmm. a little flour. Look at those. Isn't that cute? So you're gonna They're bake so it first. Pretty. They're cute. So they get like this. Okay. And then this is a great thing to do with like leftover chicken or mm -hmm. leftover pork or steak, whatever you have in your freezer. Oh my gosh, I have chocolate all over my hands. That's okay. lovely. Um, mix it up with some barbecue sauce, mm. then put it in your cups okay. and of course add cheese and Can then you you'll use like taco seasoning it. too yeah instead totally of totally mm -hmm. um and if you don't you know you don't need to use the meat you can just add a bunch of different veggies but add the cheese bake it until it melts and gets all nice and ooey yeah. gooey over here add toppings if you want so i would eat a, yeah aren't they these so are cute? so cute this i feel like this could also be a meal yeah, and this could be great. Like even if you had a party, when you yeah, when you totally. like, it's a great like Sunday football. Yes. Yeah, I know you go. might need to bring this up to your Sunday football rotation. Uh, maybe. Are y'all still making um, pizzas every Sunday? <sighs> yeah, we try to. Yeah, they have a pizza, pizza Sunday. Sunday. Carson Daly is a. I'm into it. Carson's the pizza one. Chef. I'm into it. <laughs> All right, to get these snack recipes, head to today.com/food.
We are back with an Olympics-fueled edition of Tune Up Tuesday. We've been motivated by the strength and power of our Team USA athletes. Well, today, our pal, today, nutritionist Joy Bauer is here. She's going to share two energy-boosting snacks. Good morning, Hi. Joy. Good morning, guys. We are totally obsessed with the Olympics in my house. We have it on 24-7, and these athletes are insane insanely talented. So I love that I have the opportunity to share or present two energizing recipes. And the key here is that both of the recipes, aside from tasting totally delicious, they combine protein and fiber to mm -hmm. help steady blood sugars and sustain our energy. So and let's start with breakfast. So I'm calling this, um, it's a banana bread overnight goat <gasps> meal, but not because goat it doesn't milk? have any goat oh. milk. <laughs> It's because we have we've designated in my house that it is the greatest of all oh, time. Oh, that kind of okay. good. <laughs> it's a lot to live yes, up to. I think you're going to love it. Okay. okay. So I'm starting with a very ripe banana. If you guys have speckly brown bananas, it's mm. key because the riper it is, the sweeter yeah. mm -hmm. your pudding will be. And I mashed it up right here. If your banana is a little firm, all you have to do is peel it and microwave mm. for about 30 seconds, and it's an easy mash. This is a quarter cup of plain Greek yogurt. Okay. Now I'm adding in, this is almond milk, half a cup, but you know, you're the boss of your sauce, so you can put in whatever type of milk you have. Okay. Next, half a cup of old fashioned rolled oats. Mm -hmm. Not the instant? Don't do the instant because I like the larger particles mm -hmm. of the old fashioned for this particular recipe. Okay. And this is a tablespoon of ground flaxseed or you could ah. use chia seed. Mm -hmm. It's very important because this is going to help everything come together when we stir it up mm -hmm. and it gets it nice and swelled and firm. And this is a little bit of ground cinnamon and a dash of vanilla. And I'm just going to put in a pinch of salt. Mm -hmm. So that's it. And the reason we call this mm. overnight oats is because you prep it the night before, you mix this up, and then you put it in a pretty little container. I use a mason jar just like this. Right. That's great. I have all these ingredients at home, too. I know. This I'm like, okay, I'm very good. Cool. When I get home. Now, and you, you put that in the fridge? In the fridge. So I made this one last night. You have to see the hearty serving that it makes. And I'm going to just really show good. you how luscious this is. Look at this, guy. Joy, how I long mean, does it last oh, nice. in the fridge? It'll last about three days in the fridge. Okay. And you could also make multiples one night. And then for several days in advance, you have a whole great big bunch. And what I like to do in the morning is I'll garnish with some toasted that pecans. So mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm telling you, this has all the cozy feels of banana bread but not a drop of added sugar and boy when I tell you it hits the sweet spot oh, yeah, there's no sugar that's there. great that looks great. amazing your no next thing's got sugar. a little caffeine in it Joy oh yeah so we are making what I'm calling coffee bars it's basically a do-it-yourself energy bar with a kick of caffeine there mm. they are so so I'm starting here with this is a cup of oats and I'm adding in, this is a crispy rice cereal, just mm -hmm. like Rice Krispies, mm -hmm. but if you could find a brand that has brown rice, home run. Right. Okay. This is co cocoa powder, mm -hmm. and here comes our jolt. <laughs> we, I, we have a tablespoon of instant coffee, oh. or you could put in espresso powder oh. and a little bit of salt. Now you mix this up, mm -hmm. and this will be your dry ingredients. Now I'm gonna show you the wet ingredients. As they slide the onto the part, screen. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. All sorts of elves behind the scenes. <laughs> Ian, Ian Bauer. And so now I have my wet ingredients. All this here, it's some peanut butter that I mixed with some honey uh -huh. and um, a little bit of vanilla extract. You mix the dry ingredients in. I'm going to save some time. This mixes up yeah. and you put it into a pan that looks just like this with parchment paper. Mm -hmm. And you press, 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 press. You'll see I also added a little bit of mini dark chocolate chips. Right. You, you really want to compress it. So I'm pressing it down over here. And the chocolate chips give it a little bit of something special mm -hmm. extra. And then you put it in the fridge for about 30 minutes. And guys, you cut. Oh, look so you at no bacon. Cut at no bacon. No. That's great. You cut it right into that, bars. Oh, that looks good. And again, yeah. it's got the protein. It has the fiber. It has a little bit of caffeine. So this is not something oh. you want to have close to bedtime. But also, guys, if you want to make it kid friendly or you're caffeine sensitive, 
Just yeah. leave out the caffeine sure. and you have a super okay, healthy delicious. Yeah. There you go. I'm yeah. coffee, Perfect. but I want that dessert. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. You're, this, is good. Yeah. this is great. This is Chanel not on caffeine. And listen. Yeah. <laughs> I know exactly. <laughs> hey, gold medal, Joy. Thank you so Thank much. You. For these Bye recipes. Mwah. Yay. For these recipes and more, head to today.com slash food. Hey guys, welcome to The Boost. One thing we love to see, women supporting women. So today we're celebrating sisterhood in all of its glory, from the sisters you were born with to the sisters you choose. And we're starting off with the 40 plus double dutch club where women are helping each other maximize their physical and mental health. No kids, no pets, and no stress. That's part of the motto of the 40 Plus Double Dutch Club, a group of women over 40 gathering weekly to jump rope. Where's she at? Where's she go? What is the 40 Plus Double Dutch Club? Sisterhood. Most of us came for the Double Dutch and having fun with our friends, we stay for the sisterhood because that's what it's become. Pamela Robinson and Katrina Dyer Taylor founded the group on the south side of Chicago in 2016 when Pam was going through a tough time. I felt like I was sinking. My marriage was coming to an end. My kids were growing up. They didn't need me the same way they had. I just needed to find something that was for me. After jumping double dutch at a Memorial Day barbecue, she felt something shift. It made me forget about everything that was going wrong in my life. I felt like a kid again. And that was the feeling I needed to rediscover. <laughs> then I went to Katrina's the next day and told her. What was your response? Because I knew exactly what Pamela was going through at the time. Whatever it is, I'm there. What began as seven women in a parking lot has grown into a sisterhood of nearly 200,000 with clubs in over 100 cities in the U.S. and abroad. We caught up with them at a meetup. Women from all walks of life displaying their ages proudly. What's your day like? What's finding self-care and support. I'm kind of a caregiver for a couple of people, and so I needed something to take care of myself. I just was trying to learn how to do life yeah. as a mom, as a wife. I was unemployed as well, and it was just a really dark time. Miss Shirley had never jumped double dutch before. How does it feel to be out here jumping rope at 87 years old? It feels great. And they said I inspired them, but they're keeping me young. As a first timer, I have to admit, I was a little nervous to jump in. Because y'all are real skilled, but <laughs> if you don't get this, I owe the whole crew dinner. But after some encouragement from the ladies, okay, what do I need to do? I was ready. Their movement has become about more than just jumping rope. <laughs> From their No Sister Left Behind Fund, which provides financial assistance to members in need, to community service for those who are in shelters and incarcerated. What impact do you think this is having? It's helping women not only to improve our physical health, but also our mental and our spiritual health as well. We have women that are dealing with grief, loss, depression. We know it's not just about jumping rope. It's really about saving lives. And it shows them that you're not alone. You're not the only one that's going through this. You have somebody. You have a whole sisterhood now. A sisterhood for you. What do you think makes this sisterhood so strong? Good for all of us. The love that we all have, the genuineness, the authenticity of this group. It's really the love and the fellowship. We are women who are not competing with each other. We're getting together to uplift each other, to encourage each other, to inspire each other to be the best versions of ourselves that we can be. Dylan Dreyer stumbled upon a group of women who are bonding one step at a time. And when they go on a walk, you cannot miss them. Let's meet the city girls who walk. 
If you would have told me 250 people would come to a walk in New York City, I would have never believed you. <laughs> Every walk is a good walk for Brianna Cohn. It's one thing to go for a walk or go for a walk with friends, but you turned this into something huge. I was feeling a little lonely, a little isolated, and I was like, what if I posted on my TikTok? What if we did a walk club where we just like drink our coffee, we chit chat, we leave our worries behind. The 28-year-old fitness trainer who had already amassed millions of followers across TikTok and Instagram asked her community if they would join her for a walk around New York City's Pier 45. People were like, oh my God, I want to join. This sounds amazing. Like, People were sending it to their friends, and I was not expecting that. I was expecting like 10, 20 people. On her first group walk back in March of this year, more than 100 women showed up for a stroll, and City Girls Who Walk was born. How would you describe a perfect walk? You listen to that feel-good music, and you just get lost, lost outside, lost in the time, and just a quick like 30, 30 minute walk, that's all you need. Brianna didn't want the walking group to be a huge commitment. The plan was once a week for a 40 minute walk. That's it. Some girls like go to brunch after, some just hang out and chat. What is it about walking with others? When you're walking by yourself, I feel like so many thoughts come into your head, but if you walk with someone else, you can kind of forget all of that and just talk about life and just like feel that connection. The event blew up on social media with hundreds of women showing up week after week forming a sisterhood in the process. So who goes on these walks? Who's walking together? It ranges, not kidding, from like 18 to 65, 70. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Soon, women in other cities like Philadelphia, Boise, and Phoenix were creating their own branches of city girls who walk. What's some of the most meaningful feedback you've received from this? I actually pulled up one of my favorite quotes that somebody said to me. They said, City Girls Who Walk has changed my life. It is so, so much richer and more full of love with dear new friends in a season when I really, really needed them. I can't thank you enough. How so does that make you feel? It's, it honestly, like, it could bring me to tears. Like, it's helped so many girls, and that's exactly why I started it. The future is bright for Brianna. She started weekly picnics for city girls who don't feel like walking and is hoping to expand to group fitness classes as well. What advice would you have for folks at home watching this who just kind of need that extra push to get off the couch and to just get outside? I would love every single person to come. Just take that first step, just like get off the couch, come, you don't have no idea like who's gonna be there, who you're gonna meet. It could be your best friend for like your life. Back here on the boost with a truly unique sisterhood. Okay, there's an apartment complex in the suburbs of Chicago where women from different generations are forming lifelong friendships. Take a look. <laughs> Jennifer Rossner is proof that age is just a number. The Rat Pack was, was the music I listened to in high school. No one else did, but that's what I was blasting on my radio. Sinatra, I met Tony Bennett. That was like probably the, the high point of my life. Growing up an only child, this millennial found herself surrounded by some slightly senior sidekicks. 
I was always with my parents all the time and my grandparents and my aunts. I was always kind of dragged along to adult activities and so I grew up fairly fast. When the pandemic hit, Jennifer left the bustling city life of Chicago to move back in with her parents in the suburbs. I actually didn't think it was possible to be closer to them. So I'm single, if anyone's um, listening, and I realized that I probably won't increase my chances of meeting anybody by living with my parents at 35, 36 years old. So she made her way here, just blocks from her parents, in an apartment complex full of mainly older, semi-retired folks. I had no expectation of what I would find once I got here. The general range is, is probably 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and then there's me in my 30s. She started to feel at home after attending a happy hour held by the building's unofficial mayor. What I found in the happy hours is it attracted people from all ages and all segments of our world that we live in around here. We just began to really enjoy each other's company. It wasn't long before they became a close-knit crew, celebrating birthdays, holidays, taking dance lessons, and eating out a lot. I don't know that I've ever had like a, like someone there for every single thing that I possibly need them for outside of like my parents. And at any point in time, I have someone to do something with, which is a total novelty. This is like true companionate love. We truly have a sisterhood here. And if you had told me that in my 50s, I'd be making friends that I'm going to have forever, I would have said no way. I call it fancy dormitory living. We walk, we talk about boys. I'm not dead yet, so I love talking about guys and boys. Moments spent with this community bring back fond memories of Jennifer's late grandmother, May Molly. She had this really cool group of girlfriends and they would play Mahjong every Wednesday and she'd go out to dinner with my grandpa on Fridays and Saturdays. And so when I met these girls in this building, I was really struck by each one of them kind of has a quality of her. So I almost kind of found her in all of them. While she found a family in these ladies, they found the same with her. She's very close to her mom and my daughter was, and I'm gonna start crying now, my daughter and I were always close and you know, she's in New York now. You know, she's kind of pulled me into that, not because of my age or anything, but just because of family. And instead of playing Mahjong like her grandmother did, the squad gets together for a game of Rummy Cube every night. No one is aligned on what the rules really are. How many did you take again? Well, how are we playing? Oh, oh here we go. Oh. Okay. Oh. Yeah, this works. There have been some um, fairly heated moments where someone has said to take a walk. Oh, there she is. No, goes. you don't like <laughs> But all in good fun. A sisterhood created in the unlikeliest of places. I think we have to really think about intrinsic human qualities, what makes us all the same, and lean into that stuff, and everything else around it is crap. And, and just find the things that are relatable, and if you do that, anyone can become a friend. Now to students building confidence and creating their own lifelong sisterhood through rock climbing. Let's see how they help each other reach the top. Here's Chanel Jones. Rock climbing takes you out of your comfort zone and it like strengthens you in ways that you didn't know was possible. Every month, a special group of students and mentors meet here at this rock climbing gym in Queens. Got it, got it, yeah! <laughs> nice footwork. Nice. nice. They're here to climb, of course, but the skills they gain and the goals they set go far beyond reaching the top of the wall. Okay, so show of hands, how many of you before this program um, had been rock climbing before? That would be none of you. <laughs> Emanuela, Deanna, and Marjana are just a few of the 30 climbers who are part of Young Women Who Crush. <laughs> it's a rock climbing and leadership development program empowering girls in high school and gender expansive youth in New York City. So what made you decide to give this a try? The free membership. <laughs> <laughs> I tried it. And now I can stop doing it. The first climbing session, I basically only went up like two feet probably. And then I was screaming and like shaking and all that. But everyone was so supportive and like making sure like you're safe and all that. I thought that this community is something so, so special for me. The program was co-founded in 2017 by Alexis Krauss, 
Eva Kalea and Emily Varisco, all climbers who are aiming to change the landscape and accessibility of the sport. For the first time you got these girls together, did you realize that you were onto something? There was a spark in the air. There was so much love and support and investment in each other, and we just wanted to keep it going. Emily, I know you've been a coach for years. Why is a program like this needed? I just really wanted to create a space where young women could feel comfortable and not like they were being watched or judged. Climbing has changed my life and so to just share that and have built this community with all of them that's just become so much bigger than anything that even Emily and I could have ever imagined. Now it's in its fourth year the students, some of whom are first generation Americans and immigrants, are guided by mentors, helping them build strength and confidence, both physically and mentally. Okay, you gotta start somewhere. You gotta start somewhere, okay, that's true. Yeah. It's a place that 23 year old returning member, Marjana, credits for creating pathways and opportunities for her. When I went to college, I was the only person of color in the climbing team and person wearing hijab and Muslim and women. So, You're just trailblazing yeah, all yeah. of <laughs> Although it was intimidating at times, mm -hmm. it felt like I also deserve to be here. And then at the end of my college years, I actually led the climbing team at my school. One of the things that I think has been most surprising to me through the program is just the way that the kids have grown and the way that we see them being leaders in their own community. Climb on! It was support that I certainly felt nice. when the young climbers showed me the ropes. Here we can look so easy. So strong. Fun. That's good. Nice. Yeah. That was fun. The eight month long program culminates in an outdoor trip to upstate New York. And for the first time ever in the group's history, this year's climb was led by a team of women and non-binary rock guides, a field that's historically been dominated by men. It's just been this really huge moment for us to like pause and look around the crag and be like, this is us, like we built this. It's so interesting because already I feel a sisterhood with you guys. It's kind of like a second family. You can come to a session having like the worst day of your life and as soon as you see someone's face from here, it just like lightens you up. We're so present with like being happy with like a group of people who just want to see you do good. Welcome back to The Boost. Our very own Jenna Bush Hager has often shared with us the special bond she has with her twin sister, Barbara. And the two have a new children's book hitting the shelves. It's called Love Comes First, a true display of the importance of sibling support. My grandmother's life was defined by love. 
And what I admired most about her is that her love was limitless. She spread her light everywhere she went. You are a beautiful girl. She cherished her many visits to the Barbara Bush Children's Hospital in Portland, Maine. That is wonderful. Which was named in her honor in 1998. We haven't had her in our life in five years. And so to be reminded of her just in the little things around this place always makes us feel pretty good. Three years after we lost our precious Ganny, a twist of fate. My sister unexpectedly gave birth to her daughter, Cora Georgia, in this very hospital. I lived in New York and happened to be in Maine for the weekend. And I woke up in the middle of the night in labor in Kinney Bunkport, and my husband Googled hospitals near me. And because she was six weeks early, she needed to be in the NICU. And that is when I first realized that Barbara Bush Children's Hospital existed. I went to visit her in the NICU. It's going to make me cry. <laughs> and looked on the wall, and it said, Barbara Bush Children's Hospital. So it just felt very divine that she was born here and she got an excellent care. It was as if somebody was looking down. <laughs> For the first time since that remarkable day, my sister and I returned to the pediatric unit to see how kids today are living by our grandmother's example. Sisters, Sisters forever. forever! Sisters forever! Meet Juliana and Eliza Empey. Four years ago, they started a nonprofit called Splatters for Kids. They sell handmade greeting cards to raise money for the children's hospital. The girls were inspired by their 92-year-old neighbor, Richard Troub, a longtime hospital volunteer. He's been volunteering for over 15 years, so we wanted to do something because he inspired us to help others too. We first chose cards because we always send cards to our great grandma and we know that it makes her happy when we send them. You know what, our grandmother, she loved writing letters to us. Do you guys like writing letters? Yeah. yeah. Do you feel like it spreads joy? Yeah. yeah. While encouraging others to spread joy, Juliana and Eliza raised nearly $15,000. Do you guys have a goal? What's your goal? $50 million. Whoa! $50 million. Some people think kids can't do big things. What do you say? We're kids and we're here, so we can yeah. do big things. We were inspired to create our own cards with kids gathered at the hospital. Is it okay if I draw them yellow? Yeah. Do you want a yellow envelope because you like yellow? And write messages to people we love. Is that for your brother? Yeah. Willow and Emery made cards for their new baby brother, Easton, who they met the day before our visit for the very first time. There he is. Say hi. Say hi. He's a cute. Isn't he cute? Yeah. Is your brother your greatest dream come true? Yeah. Signed and sealed, it was time to deliver. Okay, should we go? Ready? Let's do, do it. it. Oh, hello, guys. Hi, girls. Welcome to the world, baby Easton. Thank you. Hi. What were y'all gonna say? I love you. Oh. Oh. Here you go. Thank you. We gave much. our cards to doctors and nurses. Thank you for saving my life. You are the best doctor ever. Thank you for making Riker safe. Oh, thank you, honey. You're welcome. To new friends. Emmett, you inspire me. I hope you're feeling good. And to Mr. Troub, a devoted volunteer and role model for us all. Isn't that wonderful? Dear Mr. Troub, thank you for inspiring us to help others. We are so glad that you're our neighbor. Thank you so much. And I'm so proud of you, too. Thank you. For all you've done. You two have been such an inspiration. So are you. Our hearts were full on a day that love truly did come first. Now, from our vault, let's throw back to Jenna and Barbara's first memoir, Sisters First. The duo shared stories from their childhood, once again showcasing a unique bond. Take a look. From the moment I was born, I had this person who lifted me up. Barbara has a huge heart. She was the type of kid that looked after everybody else in our class and wanted to make sure that everybody was taken care of. She's gentle. She's creative, she's a great artist, and she's brilliant. Jenna is extremely fun. She makes the most out of everything. She's always been an entertainer. She has a huge imagination, 
and has loved making people laugh and smile and entertaining them. She makes the most out of any situation, so she's made my life extremely fun, and she's very loving. Thanks, Sissy. So many people think they know us because of years of sort of media spotlight or articles written about us, but really we felt like the true essence of who we were or are isn't really out there. And so we wanted to um, write our own story. We realized how lucky we have been. Uh, we've had sort of an extremely incredible life and always have had a partner to go through it with because we're twins. We were always encouraged to be very different. And we were nourished to do different things. I think we were always gonna have different careers. I attended the launch of the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief when I was in my junior summer. And at the time, if you were living on the continent of Africa, you couldn't get access to antiretroviral drugs, which are the drugs that keep you alive when you are HIV positive. And so I was both angered by the inequity of that, but then inspired by seeing so many people stepping up. Sissy, welcome to my office. And this is where you work, I like it. I started Global Health Corps in 2009, and now we've worked with almost a thousand incredible young leaders. Before I was working on policy for the US government. I'm a communications and advocacy associate. And I work on a variety of issues, environment, labor. I'm so proud of Barbara, and it's important work. She works tirelessly. She's out traveling all the time, I feel how she's making the world a better place. I got to experience a small part of what it's like to train to be an astronaut. She's always loved people, she's loved telling their stories, she's loved entertaining, and so it is a natural fit for her in every way, and she's great at it. Oh, she wants it, she wants it, yes she does, yes she does. When Jenna was pregnant with Poppy, we would say to Mila all the time, we're sisters, we're sisters, and we wanted her to realize, because we realized how lucky we have been to have someone by our side and have someone that's had our back through our whole lives. She's one of the most important people in my life, and she's witnessed all of these milestones. Um, makes me want to cry, I don't know why. <laughs> it's like our life expanded because of each other, and I hope Poppy and Mila have that as well. I think a sister can be a blood sister like I so luckily have, but it can also just be a woman that has your back, that makes you feel like you're good enough, that empowers you to be your best person, to be your best self, that laughs at you, that cries with you. Um, and I had that in a blood sister. Whether it's your, your blood sister or a friend that's a sister, it's someone that will share your life with you, the good and the bad, and be alongside you as you go through life. After the break, we have an uplifting story you do not want to miss. Stay with us. We're back here on the boost with one last feel good story for you. Check it out. A high school junior with special needs brought down the house last week during their first intramural, intramural basketball game of the season. Take a look at what happened in the final seconds of the game. <coughs> no 
That right there, T. Ramirez, the buzzer beater from almost half court. Wow. The crowd goes wild. The game was in Peoria, Arizona. It allows kids with disabilities and general education students to play together in activities like basketball. After the game, Ramirez was asked about the moment, called it amazing, yes, which so it was. Thank you so much for joining us. We love shining a light on the power of sisterhood, and we hope you feel encouraged to honor the fierce female bonds in your own lives. We'll see you back here tomorrow, right here on Today All Day. And thanks for joining us on Consumer Confidential here on Today All Day. I'm Vicki Wynn. We're back with more insider tips and the latest consumer news. From warnings about knockoff weight loss drugs to what you should consider before buying pet insurance. It's all coming your way. But first, I'll look at new technology that aims to make school buses safer for students. This is video from a school bus in North Carolina. Watch as the students on the left attempt to cross the road to board the bus, but then are nearly run over. And this Ohio bus driver hailed as a hero after saving a student from being hit by that car. These incidents are known as stop arm violations. A new survey estimates this happens more than 43 million times every year. These stop arm violations can have deadly consequences. According to a government report, 13-year-old Evelyn Gurney was run over and killed by a driver in Wisconsin as she prepared to board her bus. The report stated the stop arm was deployed when the driver swerved around it and struck her. But new technology aims to make it safer for students by enabling buses to communicate directly with cars. I'm here in Indiana at the test track for IC Bus. It's the nation's largest bus manufacturer, and I'm going to show you for the first time how it all works. It's called Cellular Vehicle to Everything, or CV2X for short, and it's being developed by dozens of automakers and tech companies, including Audi and IC Bus. It just takes safety to the next level. With me is Justina Morrison from IC Bus. The bus driver slows down and extends the stop sign. Heading toward us is a car also outfitted with CV2X technology. That screen alerts the bus driver of the approaching vehicle. Here my vehicle in motion. As the car gets closer, the technology senses it has not slowed down, once again warning the bus driver, don't let kids off that bus. High speed vehicle approaching. What is that screen telling the bus driver right now? It's telling the bus driver how fast the car is approaching, how close the car is to the school bus, as well as from what direction that car is approaching the bus. So we saw how this tech works on buses, but what about for drivers of other cars who really need to know where those kids are? With me is Palm Mohotra from Audi to talk about what the experience is like behind the wheel. Palm, how will this prevent crashes? So the technology that we have in the Audi e-tron actually communicates directly with the school bus up to 10 times a second. And it doesn't matter if the driver in the vehicle is actually able to see the other vehicle hmm. or not because it can look around corners, it can sense a vehicle through an obstruction like another vehicle. And this is how we prevent accidents on the road and save lives. Let's see how it works. This time the bus is stopped, but I can't see it because it's hidden from view by that semi-truck. As I approach, I get a warning on my dashboard. Wow, so Palm, I don't even see a bus or any stop signs, but already the car's telling me something's ahead. Exactly, and it's telling you, heads up, you need to slow down. Okay, let's see what happens when I don't slow down. And there's the warning. It gives me an extra time to react, and that can be the difference between life and death. Absolutely. We try it again, now with the semi-truck behind the bus as I maneuver to pass it. This is a very real scenario. A big rig slowed down in front of me, I don't see anything, so I'm just gonna change lanes around it, but. I'm already getting an indication. There's a school bus. Now I'm getting the stop indication. And if I don't stop, there's that alert. And I had plenty of time to stop. And CV2X isn't limited to buses and cars. It can be used to alert drivers to approaching emergency vehicles, upcoming construction zones, bicycles, even pedestrians, as long as they're equipped with the cellular technology. But the safety benefit that it delivers on the road is incredible. Incredible safety when everything on the road can communicate so we can avoid scenes like this.
The technology is not exclusive to Audi or Navistar. Nearly every automaker is working to get this into their vehicles as quickly as possible. Audi says they're hoping it will be standard technology in their vehicles within three to five years. Now, if you think that's a long time, the FCC actually set aside the bandwidth to make this all possible all the way back in 1999. Next, drugs like Ozempic are being used for weight loss, and recently, more websites have been selling knockoff versions. But are they safe? These days, it seems like everyone is looking to shed a few pounds. Baby, the hype is real. But as the craze for using diabetes drugs for weight loss grows, so too is the emerging market to get so-called knockoff versions of these popular medications, all without a prescription. A new report by the Wall Street Journal found more than 50 websites selling semaglutide and terzepatide, the active ingredients in diabetes drugs like Ozempic and Manjaro. Anytime demand vastly outstrips supply, entrepreneurs will step into the breach. While nearly all of the websites have disclaimers that the ingredients are not for human consumption, the journal found some had instructions for how people could use the substances on their own. They're not verifying who you are and they do things like prefer to be paid in Bitcoin. The paper also says at least 18 of the sites have run ads on Instagram and Facebook in recent months, including ones like these from SAF Research, offering huge gains and a buy one, get two free deal on their vials of semaglutide. Facebook and Instagram's parent company Meta says they've removed ads for the sites on their platforms after being flagged by the journal telling NBC News in a statement reading in part, our policies prohibit the advertisement of prescription drugs without the proper authorization and approval. On its website, SAF Research offers numerous disclaimers stressing their products are not dietary supplements, but instead research chemicals for laboratory use only. But some are choosing to ignore these kinds of warnings. Across the websites they reviewed, the journal found that a month's supply of the ingredients cost around $100 to $200, compared to brand name drugs like Ozempic, which can cost around $1,000 a month without insurance. Lori Sicatello says she was prescribed Ozempic for her type 2 diabetes last year. Months later, she hit an insurance coverage gap, making it too expensive for her. They said now it's going to be $754. So she began taking research-grade semaglutide that her friend found online for about $100 a month. What's really in this? What am I, what am I taking here? By the end of the month, I wasn't comfortable with taking it anymore. The FDA is now sounding the alarm about the potential dangers of buying these ingredients online, saying in a statement that they advise consumers to not purchase peptides marketed as sold for research use and mix, ingest, or inject them. There are no FDA-approved generic versions of these substances, and drug makers Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly say they don't supply their ingredients to companies selling research substances. Earlier this year, our NBC News investigation found more than a dozen telehealth websites advertising Ozempic for weight loss. I experienced firsthand just how easy it was to get these medications online at a low cost. Met my request. I had my Ozempic prescription by the very next day. My producer also got a prescription. This is Jamie. No one ever saw us on video or in person, and neither of us has diabetes or would be medically defined as obese. While it may seem like it's becoming easier than ever to get your hands on these drugs, experts say doing so comes at your own risk. I really advise patients to steer clear of the online versions because we just can't control the quality or the safety in those cases. The Wall Street Journal tells us some of the websites they contacted have already been taken down. We reached out to SAF Research for additional comment. We have not heard back. The website says they use different marketing tools to reach their audience and that none of their ads make claims that could send the wrong message about their products. SAF also emphasizes they do not sell supplements or medications. With so many counterfeit options, Novo Nordisk actually launched a website, semaglutide.com, to help people spot the difference between what's real and what's fake. Coming up, is pet insurance really worth it? How to decide if it's right for you. Plus, tips to help college students eat healthier on a budget.
Welcome back, Americans. We love our pets, and more owners are now getting pet insurance. But it can be confusing to figure out if it makes sense for you. We help break it down. We love our pets like family. An estimated 111 million American households have a dog or cat. And just like any member of the family, health care is important, but an emergency vet visit can cost between $250 to $1,600. It's prompted a booming business in the U.S., pet insurance. The number of policies purchased at the end of last year has risen nearly 93% since 2019. It's another kid. You know, I have three daughters and I have Lucy. You got her as a puppy and immediately you thought, this is a good idea to have insurance for our pet. Why? Well, just like you would insure your children. You want to make sure, you know, if something bad happens that they're protected. Jeff Foose purchased a policy from True Panion, among the nation's largest pet insurance companies. He says his coverage started at $33 a month for Lucy. But after nine years, the cost has risen to almost $80 a month. That's a 141% increase. Foose says in some years, his rate increased more than the 20% his policy said it would never exceed annually. Do you think this was a worthwhile investment? Absolutely not. It can be hard to tell if pet insurance is worth it for you. We requested quotes from five popular companies using Bruno, a three-year-old mixed breed dog. For similar coverage and a deductible between two to $500, take a look at the rates. Embrace at the low end at $41 a month, Trupanion the highest at $167. None covers routine exams. We would absolutely recommend that you get your insurance when you have a puppy or kitten because that's when a pet doesn't have any pre-existing conditions. Margie Tooth is the president of Trupanion. The company brought in almost a billion dollars in revenue last year and says it's paid two billion in claims since the company was founded in 2000. We asked her about Jeff Foose's case and other complaints that Trupanion has raised its premiums to unaffordable levels that are far higher than vet care inflation. You said it's important to your company not to make consumers feel like it's a bait and switch, and yet we have talked to some who feel like they're not getting what they were promised. How do you respond to those criticisms? It's very disappointing to hear that people feel that way. I think we, we work very hard to ensure that we're explaining our value proposition and that we make it clear to people when they sign up with us that your price may change. Do you think there's enough regulation to make this industry uh, transparent and to help consumers really understand the pricing models? I do not. I think it's changing. I think it needs to continue to change more. It's a bad financial product. Kevin Brassler is executive editor for Consumers Checkbook, a nonprofit providing price research and consumer advice. In the case of pet insurance, we found that overall, compared to the payouts and the premiums you have to pay and all the other out-of-pocket expenses, they're generally really bad deals for most pet owners. Do you think it's a better idea to set aside some money in a rainy day fund rather than paying these premiums? Yeah, I mean, you're going to do far better off financially in the long run by taking those premiums that you'd pay to pet insurance companies and just saving them and taking care of your pet's costs out of pocket. If you want to buy pet insurance, Brassler says check accident-only policies to cover emergencies like car accidents or poisoning and look for a higher deductible plan to lower your monthly payments. Foose says he would have been better off with a rainy day fund. If you had just paid out of pocket for Lucy's incidents, mm -hmm. would you be ahead? I'd be ahead of about $2,300, $2,400. We reached out to Embrace. They told us their policies provide peace of mind and like insurance for homes, cars, and people, pets should be protected too. Up next, healthy and budget-friendly meal ideas for college students. And later, I'll look at what's fueling the growth in popularity of stick shifts. Consumer Confidential continues after this break.
Welcome back to Consumer Confidential. College students, they're not making the grade when it comes to healthy eating. So I hit the grocery aisles with a chef who specializes in healthy and budget-friendly meals. With nearly 3 million freshmen expected to attend college this fall, many students will live on their own for the very first time. A fresh taste of freedom served with a full plate of new responsibilities. Gail Cresci, a registered dietitian at Cleveland Clinic Children's, says as first-year students adapt to college life, some may struggle to maintain a healthy diet, a time I remember all too well. It was a lot of pizza, it was a lot of cookies, it was a lot of eating late at night. And a lot of contributing factors to the so-called freshman 15. Where are some areas that calories like to hide and sneak into a first-year student's diet? We find hidden calories in things like alcohol. Another area is with coffee. You may get some of those extra syrup flavorings, the whipped cream that's on those coffees. We see a lot of extra calories with fast food. What are three things you might advise a first year student when it comes to eating healthy? Avoid eating late at night if at all possible. And you're going to be hungry during the day, so have some healthy snacks available that are quick grab and goes. Another thing is to make sure you're drinking adequate water. She also recommends eating 20 to 30 grams of protein at each meal, which equals about three ounces of chicken breast or lean beef. This is where you live when okay. you're in college. We've called on chef, TV personality, and senior food editor for Budget Bites, Monte Carlo. Monty, class is in session. Yeah. Clearly we got the assignment. You're Kale University. Okay, School of Hard Knocks. Yes, I'm representing University of San Francisco. So you say that when kids are off on their own for the first time, mm -hmm. often cooking on a budget, you gotta start with an A-plus grocery list. You have to start with an A-plus grocery list. And the best part is it's a really cheesy, easy one. Let's go. Let's start with fresh fruits and vegetables. Okay. It's important to eat nutritiously, yes. but this stuff is expensive and it doesn't always last a long time. No, it doesn't. This has the life of like a Disney star. What, like 24 hours? But the best deal for you when you want berries in your life is to go frozen. These fresh blueberries cost about five bucks a pound, but for the same price, you can buy three times that amount frozen, adding them to oatmeal, yogurt, or smoothies. Let's talk about packaged produce. Yes. What's your tip here? Do not do it. It's a no-no? No, come on. You're gonna pay like five dollars for poor little pieces of corn when you could buy this for 59 cents a pop, right? Ah. Just peel it, bro. It's not that hard. And right. if you have a microwave, you have fabulous fresh corn. Carlo, who teaches college cooking classes, says when it comes to appliances, every dorm room or apartment also needs a coffee pot. You can use it to make soups. You can use it to make eggs. Anything that you would stew or heat up in a pot, you can make in a coffee pot. <laughs> The next part of our lesson, a study of hot deals on frozen meals. A staple of college life is pizza. pizza. But you don't want to be dialing that pizza delivery company. No. One pepperoni pizza is $17. You can get three for $10. Carlos suggests stocking up on a variety of store brand frozen vegetables to use as pizza toppings. It's starting to feel kind of gourmet. Okay. Or as a way to help another college classic earn some extra credit. Are you ready for the pop quiz? I guess so. Which country consumes the most ramen per person per year? USA? No! Vietnam! Yeah! We love our ramen. Costing three bucks for six servings, Carlo partially cooks the noodles and divides them into mason jars with the veggies. When you're ready to eat, you add a little water, a little broth, you put it in the microwave, and you're set. So you just pre-make these ramen jars? Yes using your noodle to find a cart full of savings. Winning. Class dismissed. Ah! For other budget-friendly tips, consider shopping store brands and downloading the store's app for extra savings. Also, shop the less popular cuts of meat, like chicken thighs or sirloin tip steaks, and add beans to meat dishes for more bulk and protein. Now, let's switch gears to the recent growth in popularity of stick shifts. I hadn't driven a stick in nearly 20 years, so we found the best instructor to rev up my skills, a NASCAR champion. Drift, slide, side to side. But before we get into my skills behind the wheel, let's revisit that time in 2019. When Dylan and Al taught Craig and Chanel how to drive with a manual transmission. I didn't even feel you change it. Because I'm that good. As for me in 2023, you decide. Let's take it for a spin. All 
right, all right. So that's not exactly how it went, but I was in for some fun. Today we're outside City Field here in Queens, New York, and this this is the brand new Mustang Dark Horse. It is a manual transmission car. I can't wait to take it for a spin. Problem is, the last time I drove a stick was 15 years ago. But lucky for me, look who we have here, NASCAR Hi. driver, Coca-Cola 600 champion, Ryan Blaney. Hi, thank you so much you? for being here. Yeah. So there is a rise in interest in these manual transmission cars. What's the appeal, Ryan? I feel like the appeal of manuals is it kind of makes the driver feel one with the car. You're engaged. It, yeah, that's a great word. It makes you very engaged with the car. So I'm really excited to show you around it. Okay, so you'll stay with me as I kind of like go oh, yeah. through the bumps? I got you. <laughs> All right, let's do you. it. All right. I'm the first TV journalist to drive the dark horse. I know, tough assignment. What is the first thing I should be thinking about? So first thing is, left foot in on the clutch. Okay. As you're letting your left foot off the clutch, and you know, your right foot's going down to the gas, and it's like got an even motion. So a lot of people kind of dump the clutch, and that's when you get like the big herky jerky. Did you bring a bar bag? Yeah. There we go, all right, all right. You know, it's like riding the bike. I'm picking it back up again. Yeah. And you know what? This, I have to pay attention when I'm driving a stick. There's no time for texting and being on the phone. Your right hand's working, your left hand's on the steering wheel. You're not gonna be on your phone, right? While stick shifts accounted for 1.3% of sales in the U.S. in June, searches for new manual cars are up 13%. It's a bright spot in an otherwise downward trend. In 2000, more than 15% of new and used cars sold by CarMax were manual. By 2020, it was only 2.4%. Compare that to electric vehicles, which now make up 5% of car sales. Let's switch gears and have you show me how it's really done. Okay, yeah? let's do it. <laughs> but before we do, Ryan revs up the settings on the car. Ooh, you put it on some sort of race flag mode. We're going to have some fun. I'm excited. You can't do worse than I did. I actually went off the track. Woo! Yeah, here we go. So what mode are we in right now? Woo! Super fun mode? Yeah, super fun mode. <laughs> what do I smell? Is that rubber? Yeah. <laughs> That was like real life Fast and Furious, Ryan. Yeah, I don't recommend anyone doing that on Definitely. the roads. But we were here, we were safe, and I'm happy you had fun. Ford's manual transmission Bronco is also seeing a spike in interest. There's a lot more people ordering them, and you can definitely tell that they're getting, becoming more popular. Autumn Schwalbe is a future product planner for Ford's performance cars. She says aside from the fun of driving a stick, manuals can be cheaper too. On average, stick shifts cost nearly $1,800 less than automatics. What are your friends saying about manual transmission? I do know a lot of people that are super willing to learn at my age. As for me, I finished in victory lane. I didn't have to do much teaching, so I was, I'm just happy I just get to sit here and ride. Best journalist driver of the day? By far. <laughs> your check will be in the mail later. <laughs> Up next, a mom creating diverse and inclusive dolls for everyone. the heels of Barbie mania, there's renewed interest in dolls. And I recently met a mom on a mission to make playtime more inclusive. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Ken. 
Barbie's blockbuster summer brought dolls back into the spotlight. And a look at what's for sale now reveals a slew of new toys, from dolls for boys and female action figures to Miniland's dolls representing children with Down syndrome and Mattel's fashionista line featuring a doll in a wheelchair. Even Lego spreading love to the LGBTQIA community with this Everyone is Awesome set. In a $40 billion industry, 50% of parents rank diversity and representation as a top consideration when toy shopping. I was just shocked by the fact that I couldn't find a single doll that I thought looked remotely like any Asian child I know. Eleanor Mack says last year, while shopping for a doll resembling her now three-year-old daughter, Jillian, she was disappointed. You only knew those dolls were Asian because they had a name like Ling, or they were holding a panda bear, or they had that really bad blunt haircut. Yeah! <laughs> American Girl produced Corinne Tan, a Chinese-American doll in 2022, in part to help kids deal with anti-Asian racism. But Max says the doll's backstory highlights the Chinese father's lack of work during the pandemic. Her Chinese-American father is this struggling ski instructor in Aspen who effectively can't provide for the family. The mom gets a divorce, remarries a wealthy white guy named Arnie. Wow, I did not know the backstory of that doll. Your reaction is exactly how I felt. And it wasn't just the backstory. And when I looked at that doll, the big round eyes, the skin color, she just didn't look Asian. American Girl telling NBC News the Corinne backstory was written by an Asian American author and designers consulted with her and an anti-Asian racism expert, among others, on Corinne's hairstyle and color, skin tone, and a new eye sculpt to more authentically reflect her Chinese American heritage. The company adding the doll has received an overwhelmingly positive response from fans. I wanted our children to be proud of their Asian eyes, to know that they are beautiful. Mac decided to make the doll she wishes she had as a girl, working with other Asian American parents to design, develop, and source the materials. Just a year after coming up with the idea for an Asian American doll who loves to bake with her grandmother, Mac introduced the world to Jilly Bing. What was your daughter's reaction when she saw this doll for the first time? She just gasped and she's like, Jilly, she looks like me. You want to color in Jilly Bing? Mac eventually left her job in healthcare. Now her San Francisco home is Jilly Bing headquarters. How many dolls in this house right now? Three or 400. Um, we started out with close to 2,000. So she has a little chef's hat that flips over and becomes this little <laughs> who doesn't love an egg tart. Exactly. Jilly Bing becoming part of a trend of non-white dolls originating in the 1960s. We're seeing games, we're seeing puzzles and it's really starting to broaden the horizon so that kids can go into a store and they're gonna see toys that really reflect the real world that we all live in. James Zahn, senior editor at the Toy Insider, says consumer spending has convinced toy makers to invest the time and money it takes to develop more inclusive products. When kids are able to play with toys that look like themselves or look like their family, their friends, whoever they're seeing in the community, I think that it just sort of works with their own development in thinking of the world as a very diverse place. And when those toys step beyond stereotypes, they can have a lasting impact for generations. And that's our time for now. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential on Today All Day. For all of us here at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn. When you think Texas, you think beef, brisket, and barbecue. But here in Austin, the state's capital, there's so much more than that. We've got folks and chefs from all around the world who are putting their mark on this city's culinary scene. And in fact, the spices and traditions that pay homage to their families are making Austin a hot food scene. It's really kind of this melting pot of different people, their culture, and their food. The creativity and, and the flavor that they put into the food is really artistry, right? It's really the diversity of food. Like You can get some of everything here. So what keeps Austin weird and tasty? We're about to find out. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other.
Austin is home to over 1,200 food trucks in food parks just like this one. But we're here for one specific truck. We're here for Tony's Jamaican, serving up fine Caribbean fare to Austin for more than 10 years. Meet food truck owner Tony Scott and his wife Kim. From humble beginnings in Kingston, Jamaica, Tony has made Austin his home since 2003, and he has always had a passion for flavorful food. When did you start cooking? How young were you? 10. Tony's mother, Hyacinth, taught her sons how to be self-sufficient, especially in the kitchen. So you learned from mom early on? Yes. What was it about cooking that you liked? I don't know, I like food at those days. <laughs> Those skills learned during childhood would help Tony define his career. For nearly a decade, he worked a small beachside business, serving jerk chicken and drinks to tourists in Jamaica. But after 9-11, tourism to the island stalled. So Tony moved to the U.S. in search of better opportunities, eventually landing in Austin. With construction booming in the state capital, Tony quickly found a job as a painter, but it was his homemade lunches that reignited an idea. You're working, you're, you bring in Jamaican food that you made, some of your friends taste and say, where'd this I, come from? I, yes, I cook my own food, you know, and they was like, oh, you should, you know, open a restaurant. And it's been 10 years. 10 years now. The 60-year-old chef opened Tony's Jamaican food truck in March of 2012 and his wife, Kim, has been one of his biggest supporters since the very beginning. What was the first meal he cooked for you? Curry chicken and rice, and he invited me over, and once I had it, I didn't want to ask for more. You know how ladies are, we try to eat a little bit, maybe the salad kind of thing, don't want them to know that we that greedy. But it was so good, I asked for seconds. So when Tony says, I want to do a food truck, your reaction? I said, a what? <laughs> I said, a food what? And I knew nothing about food trucks or however, so it was just all his idea. I just followed along. He said he wanted to do something, he had a vision. I said, okay, let's try it. Despite high praise from friends and family for his grub, Tony's business wasn't exactly booming from the start. When you first opened up, was it successful right away? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I came out here 10 o'clock in the morning and I was all here until 3 o'clock the next morning. Mm -hmm. I make $37. Wow. And, you know, I was still happy when I go home and she was like, how much money do you make? And I was like, $37. And she break out laughing. <laughs> and I was like, don't worry about it. And next day I come and I make $50 something mm -hmm. and the next day I make $80 something dollars and I say, okay, I'm seeing increase. Tony taking advantage of the South by Southwest crowds that flocked to Austin in early March. Shortly after the festival, his fledgling business got a big boost with a small write-up. Kim, what, what to you, what was the game changer? What, what put this place over the top? Wow. His presence and his dedication. Your chicken and hot sauce. Now, Loyal customers are visiting this hotspot daily, decked out with the colors and vibes of Jamaica. From curried chicken and goat to jerk everything, food fans walk away feeling the island love. In 2018, Tony laid down more permanent roots in Texas. You opened up a brick and mortar restaurant. Were you nervous about that? A little bit. It was well, a little bit. Let me hear. Kim, were you nervous? Oh, about yeah. That? I'm so glad you asked me that question. Yes, I was. It was something totally different and from a food truck going into a brick and mortar. I didn't come from the restaurant industry. I came from the finance side. Coming in, I was like, I was telling Tony, I said, I got this, you know, I can run this, no problem. But oh, no, 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 no. I was ringing the, the red light bell, like, hey, I need some help. It was challenging, but also it was fun. Kim now helping run the business for both locations. Family always mean a lot to restaurant. You know, sometimes she, she would say, you never know, one day it might be just me and you, you gotta That's show right. me how to cut this meat.
Jerk here. Jerk chicken and ox tail. Thank you Enjoy. very much, sir. Have a great day. You too. God bless. Tony Scott dishes out hundreds of plates to hungry customers each day, but he's best known for one Caribbean specialty. My mother is Jamaican, and in our house, oxtail was king. Yes. yes. Oxtail stew, oxtail and dumpling. Yeah. Oxtail, oh, wow. oxtail, oxtail. My mom is Southern, and she actually mentioned it to me. I said, oxtail, and she just said it was a beef. So I've never really had it. And then when you first had it? It was delicious. And I eat it all the time now. That's the problem. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that it was the cheapest cut of meat? Now it's considered wow. a delicacy. You go to all these oh. upscale restaurants, oxtail uh, ravioli, oh. oxtail rice, all the, it's now everybody's into oxtail. I know. No, I'm scared to go in a restaurant and not oxtail. <laughs> Does the, the price is so high. Bring on the oxtail stew! <laughs> Tony frequently sells out of the succulent oxtail, and it was finally time to see and taste why. Welcome to the chop, Mr. Oh, Han. Oh, yeah. Oh, it smells good. It smells like Jamaica. Oh, hey, hey. This is the oxtail, oh. the famous oxtail that everybody go crazy over. Mm -hmm. And these are like the Jamaican product seasoning that we use. This have a good flavor to mm. it. Oh, wow. Tony's oxtails are seasoned with a spice mix that includes garlic powder, dried onion, paprika, black pepper, sugar, salt, and a few chef secrets. This is my product that I make. It's have like onion, it, it, um, bell pepper, um, scotch bonnet pepper, mm. also have a little bit of garlic in there. So this is like your own concoction? Yes. And then this is another Jamaican product they call You have a Blue Mountain coffee? Uh, yeah. Well, they say it's the best coffee in the world. Well, right. this is the Blue Mountain product of burnt sugar. Oh, wow. And this is what we pour on it last, give it that, that good color. Then we just mix this up, make sure you rub it in properly. You want everything to rub into it. You know, normally, if you take a smell of it, even right now, oh yeah, you see, you, you, you can smell that flavor in it, and it doesn't even cook. It smells, it. smells good. Right. He then lets the oxtails marinate overnight. Then they're added to a pot with water and slow cooked for several hours. This, what it comes out to be. Oh, now we're talking. For you to taste. Well, I came to Austin. The result, truly out of this world. You see how it fall off the bone? Mm. Oh, yeah. You know, we, we make sure we cook real tender because dental is very expensive. Mm -hmm. And you know, you go to some place, you have eating that meat and you have to be here to get it off the bone. You don't do that when you come here. Good thing Tony feels like talking. I'm too busy eating. And it doesn't stop with the oxtails. Oh, is it, Mr. Hall? That's fantastic. This is curry goat right here. Taste that. <laughs> this is the jerk pork. Oh, jerk pork. I've never had jerk pork before. Oh. And that's also oh, wow. my homemade jerk sauce mm. that I made. Whoa. Okay, this is the famous curry chicken. And this is the carrot. Oh, that's so at least I can say I have my vegetables today. Yes. Look at how tender that chicken is. Tony also serves traditional peas and rice, which brought on a wave of nostalgia. This is black bean. When you open that pot, I thought, wait a minute. Yeah. This is my mother's peas and rice. This is great. And just when I thought I'd had enough? Wait a minute, I, I, I noticed. These are beef patty. I gotta try that. Oh, that's a great crust as a reminder of how far Tony's love for cooking has taken him. If you look up here, you'll see these little pots. Uh -huh. This pot right here is when I just started out. This is what I usually cook rice into. Wow. The reason why I keep this uh -huh. pot to show people is where Tony's Jamaican food is coming from. Mm -hmm. So what would you tell people who are thinking they've got a dream, they want to start something like you did? What would you tell them? First, you have to motivate yourself to do it. And never give up on your dream. 
my mama always tell me, don't make nobody tell you you can't do nothing. Tony, thank you so much. It's this a pleasure, Harry. It, it, it is it's, nice meeting you. It feels like I'm back in Jamaica. I'm glad you have that feeling. Everything but, gonna be all right. Just a few miles from the hustle and bustle of downtown Austin is Mekon Bistro. It is a spot that's loved by locals and tourists alike for its Vietnamese comfort food. Who's the better cook uh, in the family? Um, I'm not gonna even bother asking my mom about that because my mom is hands down the best cook. <laughs> <laughs> Chef Will Hyun and his siblings opened Mekon Bistro to honor their mother, Anne Hang. A refugee who fled Vietnam after the fall of Saigon, Anne working tirelessly to provide for her family in the United States. She took a chance to travel across the ocean with nothing in hand, working ever since she's been over here, working from morning to night, uh, and still provide us with a hot meal every day. When Macon first opened, Will hoped that his mom would finally stop working, but Ann had other plans. Technically, she's retired, but like I said, she, she would not stay home. Ann's passion for food starting in her home country. In 1972, Anne married Kia Huynh. They had four children in Vietnam. Anne turning to cooking to help support the family. This is my dad and my mom right, right before the fall of Saigon. When the Vietnam War ended, the family was looking toward a better future in their homeland. But in 1975, the Viet Cong began to invade Saigon. Anne's husband fled the city first, Will leaving when he was just seven years old. It was scary. We left separately, uh, me with my uncle and my mom with my three sisters that came a year later, uh, because if you get caught, you were thrown in jail. Luckily, we made it out. We were rescued by uh, cargo boats, but uh, they rescued us. They took us to the Malaysian refugee camp. Will and his uncle secured refugee status, eventually reuniting with Will's dad in the U.S. In the years spent apart from his mother, Will began experimenting in the kitchen, 
with a little nudge from his uncle. He told me that, you know, there's only two of us. You're going to have to do, you know, do your share. So learn to cook something. <laughs> In 1983, Anne made the journey to the U.S. with her daughters. Đi dược biên thì nó đi tàu nhỏ thì nó cũng hơi khó khăn nhưng mà qua được tới ấy rồi đoàn tụ gia đình thì rất mừng. Tại vì chồng con gặp lại mặt chồng con hết. Thành ra rất là sung sướng. But adjusting to a new country as refugees was a struggle. When we came over, you know, nothing in our pockets. We, we relied on government assistance a little bit. Luckily, she's a great cook. Uh, so it, it wasn't bad for us at all. But growing up, that's how she you know, shows us that she loved us, by you know, putting all that love into the food. The family moving from Houston to Louisiana, finding work in the seafood industry. But Will wasn't so happy living in a small town. When his uncle invited him to attend high school in Austin, Will said yes right away. I fell in love with Austin. The beautiful lakes, the miles of trails, the music scene. What's there not to love? <laughs> Austin's vibrant culinary scene struck a chord. After high school, Will found work in several restaurants, dreaming of being able to showcase his mom's cooking. In 2015, the entire family moving to Austin. But Ann still wasn't sure about opening a restaurant. Asked her many, many times in the past to do something like that. She's dead set against it. She said, it's just way too much work. Eventually, Ann agreed to share her recipes for just one reason, her family. Thích làm với con cái mới mới lên hái hát với con cho con. Chứ giờ lớn tuổi rồi thì cũng còn sống được bao lâu nữa. Thì lại giờ cho con được ngày nào thì hay ngày nấy thì hát cho con mình ngày nào thì hay ngày nấy thôi. She's, she's emotional because like, you know, she basically you know, she's doing everything for her kids. The first dish Will added to the menu, his mom's pho. So pho, you know, at a restaurant is basically how we do pho at home. Uh, when we cook pho at home, it's a big pot that's going to feed us for at least three days. Um, we have pho for breakfast, we have pho for lunch, we have pho for midtime snack, we have pho for dinner and follow at night for snack at night uh, until the pot's gone. With the help of his family, Will created several new dishes. Our menu does incorporate a lot of uh, fusion Asian dishes um, and that is because of the you know the family business. Uh, my, my mom's a cook, I cook, my sister cooks, my brother cooks. Uh, second beef dish was something that I've tried out. I consider myself a Texan. We love beef. It's a dish that my mom and I collaborated together to, to put out. Basically, just tubes of real nice tender beef that's been flashed in a wok. It's been six years since Macon Bistro opened, and Will and his mom still love working together. Làm ăn gia đình thì cái này cũng như giúp cho con thôi. Thầy thấy nó tự xúc động rồi mình lấy thì thôi chứ mẹ đâu có biết sao giờ. Mình thấy nó hy sinh cho con mình được thì ngày nào thì hãy lấy vậy thôi. Mình thấy nó xúc động vậy thôi. I admire her great. The courage it takes just to make that journey and to just stick with us no matter thick and thin. She's my hero. She really is my hero.
Using food to bring younger generations closer to their heritage happens in families all across America. And it's happening here at Habesha with a husband and wife team who's using their restaurant to bring their daughters closer to their Ethiopian roots. We want more than anything else people to be familiar with not just Ethiopian food, but Ethiopian culture. My name is Yine Fantu. This is my wife, Salama Bebe. We ran an Ethiopian restaurant called Habesha in Austin. When it opened in 2013, Habesha was the second Ethiopian restaurant in Austin. People stay coming in here. We give them the food. They said, where's the fork? Your hands. <laughs> Ethiopian food is eaten with injera, a fermented flatbread made with teff, a gluten-free grain. You'll see a family dining and everyone is on their phone eating and really not enjoying the, the, the event. Not you cannot here. do that in Ethiopian restaurants. You have to use your hands, you can't. Both of them. That emphasis on family is everywhere in Habesha, from the Ethiopian art and decor to Yidni and Salam's daughters, who can often be found studying at the restaurant. I think I was like around four years old when we opened, so like this is like my second home. Salam and Yidni were born and raised in different parts of Ethiopia. In the 90s, they left Africa to attend college here in the United States. Yidni immigrating to Texas, Salam to Maryland, where her family owned an Ethiopian restaurant. A chance meeting bringing them together. My dad was visiting a friend, dining at uh, her family restaurant, and she happened to be the waitress. And uh, he overheard a music playing and uh, asked her, hey, uh, where could I get the CD? And she was nice enough to, to grab the CD and hand it to him. But Yidney's dad was thinking about more than music. When he got home, he immediately gave his son a call. And he said, hey, just uh, call her and thank her for me. <laughs> <laughs> when he called me, I was like, I give it to your dad, not for you. <laughs> and then he kept calling me. I was like, OK, I think he's not going to give up. My dad was the uh, one who hooked me up. <laughs> <laughs> they dated long distance before Salam moved to Texas, the couple marrying in 2003. Their daughters, Edel and Azel, are now teenagers. I think we've always been around food. My mom's always cooking. For me, I love her pancakes. She makes <laughs> the best pancakes. Salam left the restaurant industry to focus on parenting, but Yidney knew his wife's heart was in cooking professionally. What I saw in her was the passion to own her own business. I really want to open a restaurant, and I love the customer service and cooking. In 2012, Yidney and Salam finding the perfect location for their restaurant. Austin is a, a, a very unique town in that there is people from all walks of life. And I think part of the reason that we are successful is because of that diversity. Habesh's menu honors their Ethiopian heritage with many vegetarian dishes, from stewed yellow split peas to braised collard greens. They also serve more than a dozen dishes with beef. Texas is, uh, has a lot of people that loves meat, so we have a bigger selection of meat as well. And I think my favorite dish, and that is the kutfo, or the steak tartare, when it's uh, done right. That's probably the best dish in the world. There's a ground beef and mixed with butter and spices. When the pandemic hit, Habish's popularity helped save them from closure. And I said, okay, this is it. I uh, think we're gonna fall down now. And then people, they support us. They love to be here. They send us check. They send us cards. We have a good, good community. The donations from fans kept them afloat until they figured out a to-go plan. Before COVID, takeout business was only three or 4% of our business. And overnight, we had to do 100% of our business. And by nature, Ethiopian food is not takeout, so we have to figure out a way to package the food, to market the food. After laying off most employees, the couple had to work nonstop. As the to-go business began ramping up, Edel and Azel 
pitched in to support their parents and save their beloved second home. I would write down like the orders, like the online orders, and I would like put them in the kitchen and cleaning, washing the dishes, cutting the injera, like folding it, boxing up to the orders. They did a lot, and they're part of the reason why we're still around. So I'm sorry I get a little emotional when I talk about them, but uh, yeah, they're uh, they're incredible. They're uh, just a uh, love of my life. One of the things that we instill in them is knowing who they are, uh, where their parents came from, and learning the culture, learning the food. Salam is looking forward to a busier future at her dream restaurant. I want to uh, grow this business, and a lot of people, they never had Ethiopian food. They had Chinese food, Italian food, or Indian food. So they don't know about Ethiopian food. I'm really proud of her because like she she gets frustrated at times, but she doesn't let that like stop her. A really big inspiration to me. Whenever things get hard, you just keep going. The best part working with your partner is the fact that you're there for each other, to comfort each other when it's down and uh, to be there when your partner needs you. The best part of it, he knows what I can't do. He covered the same thing. He cannot cook, <laughs> <laughs> so okay, she can handle it. With Austin's welcoming atmosphere, it's no surprise that more chefs are putting down roots in this fast-growing city. It's everything from James Beard, award-winning chef, and taqueros, and even home cooks. The thing that makes a food scene good is different cultures meeting each other and being able to influence each other. The fact that anything is possible is what makes Austin such a cool place. One thing that rings true here in Austin, no matter your background or culture, there's room for everyone at the table. Wednesday morning to you. We are following the election results in overnight. And what it may mean for the presidential campaign. It's November 8th. This is today. Surprise results. The voters have spoken in key battleground states. Republicans going down to a 